Good morning, everybody. If everybody could find their seats, we are ready to get going. On behalf of BP and the British Embassy here in Norway, it is a pleasure to welcome you here to the seminar on the road to sustainable future. Uh, welcome both to you here at the residence of the British Ambassador and all of you following us online. Uh, my name is Mona Hufset. I'm a senior lead us through the day and do my best. Now, before we start, the most important things, safety instructions, exits uh, out there, restrooms, one <laughs> outside, and, 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 and two downstairs. The ladies is in the... So we got that one. And we got a couple of uh, embassy cats here walking around. So if anybody's... Uh, they were here, so <laughs> if anybody's allergic, just so that you know. Now, I see a lot of familiar faces from last year's seminar, uh, and since we met in March of 2023, several things have happened that impact the energy sector. Yes, there is still war, um, there is high energy prices and high inflation, but there is also developments and collaboration. And in October of 2023, Norway and the UK established a green industrial partnership intended to promote closer economic cooperation relating to the green transition. Norway will continue to be a stable and reliable supplier of energy and seeks to maintain a constructive and close relationship with the UK in this area, said our Prime Minister Jonas Gastera. Now, another important happening since last we met is that we have a new British ambassador to Norway. And to start us off, it is my great pleasure to introduce our host for today, the British Ambassador to Norway, Jan Thompson. We are delighted that you so generously have invited us to your residence for today. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Actually, I don't feel new anymore. I've been here for nearly a year now, but um, I guess, yeah, I, I arrived just after this event last year. So um, very good to be here. Um, so welcome to the British uh, Embassy, well, to the British residents. Welcome to my home. This is my house, actually. Um, yeah, I actually get to live here in this amazing building. Um, so, um, and so do my two cats. So I didn't realize they were running around, but whenever there's company, they're, they're always here. They like, they like a good party, and especially if there's any food on offer. Mm -hmm. So be careful if there's any food around. Um, but it's really good to have you here. Um, this is, um, as, as was just said, uh, the second energy event we've hosted here in this format together with BP, so it's becoming a bit of a tradition. Um, and of course, it's also a big moment for Norway as it's going through its first offshore wind auctioning round. Uh, congratulations for Sölya Nordsjö too, very exciting. BP, of course, one of the companies successfully qualified as a consortium with Acre Offshore Wind and, who I've seen here, and Starkraft. Um, and we're going to hear from Louise uh, Kingman later uh, from BP, SVP for Europe and the UK. Um, and we're also going to hear from Christian Rinning Tonneson, uh, CEO of Starkraft, still, <laughs> later today. Uh, just a word on Christian, of course, offshore wind um, in the UK has been really important for Starkraft, but Starkraft has also been really important for offshore wind in the UK. Um, and I think, Christian, you became CEO in 2010 when Sheringham Shoal was uh, being built, uh, your first offshore wind farm. Uh, thank you for everything you've done for um, relationship between the UK and Norway in energy. It's been massive, actually. You've been a really key figure. And, of course, you're stepping down soon. That's why I particularly pay tribute. Um, is it a couple of weeks? Uh, yes. You're counting the days? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but anyway, thank you, Christian, um, and we'll hear from you later. But today, of course, is about looking beyond the first auction round. And our title today was The Road to a Sustainable Future. Um, and what we want to really look at is what that future is going to look like and what it needs from government and what it needs from industry to, to really make it successful. Um, and it is really fitting because, as you just heard, um, our two prime ministers, Prime Ministers Sunak and Stura, um, agreed to launch a green industrial partnership when they met last October, it was now, in a meeting they had. 
Um, and that partnership, they said, should be looking particularly at new areas of collaboration, including on critical national infrastructure as we develop future energy systems, at offshore wind, low emission transport, green shipping corridors, batteries for electric vehicles, critical minerals, and so much more. So huge amount of uh, scope there. I think we'll hear about some of those themes today, but I just wanted to mention briefly uh, the picture from the UK on three of them, green maritime aviation and offshore wind. Um, on green maritime, last month, uh, the UK and Norway signed a green maritime MOU. Um, the uh, um, Fisheries and Ocean Minister Milseth was there in London to sign that. Uh, that is looking in particular at promoting cooperation on decarbonisation, digitalisation, automation, um, and also developing a green shipping corridor uh, between the UK and Norway. So really, really some good progress there already. On aviation, uh, we are, the UK is leading the way on uh, reducing emissions in uh, air transport, and BP indeed is a key stakeholder in developing sustainable aviation fuel. We have a jet zero strategy, which aims to achieve zero aviation emissions by 2050. Uh, we've got a future flight program as part of that with £300 million um, to kind of push that forward. Uh, we have uh, nearly £2 billion in grants from our Aerospace Technology Institute to build future aircrafts and infrastructure. And it was really good that uh, the Norwegian Transport Ministry, I think some people are here today, um, with the Norwegian CAA and airlines went to the UK uh, just last month to see our progress um, and to, to look at, at what they might learn as well or share as you in Norway look to develop your own zero emission flight. And lastly on offshore wind, uh, so our first turbines went into the water back in 2000, so that's 24 years ago. Um, we, have, uh, we have a long history now with offshore wind. Uh, we have over 14 gigawatts of operational capacity now. We have an ambition of 50, up to 50 gigawatts by 2030. Um, our pipeline of projects means that by 2030, We've got about, we're expecting about 150 billion in pounds of private investment invested into new projects. Uh, floating alone, we're expecting maybe 40, up to 45 billion pounds of investment by 2050. Um, and we've got a pipeline of 78 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity um, in the pipeline. Um, so I, I think overall that means so far, and anyway, we've received the most foreign direct, direct investment in offshore wind anywhere in the world. Um, so that just says the future is hopefully bright in due course also for, for Norway. Um, we were obviously pioneering with our contracts for difference model. Uh, that has helped us in general to bring down costs uh, and to become a kind of global leader on offshore wind. Uh, we did, I have to say, meet some challenges in our last allocation round. Uh, need to acknowledge that, uh, supply chain pinches, rising inflation and so on. Um, and in we launched that ro round before we saw the, the consequences of the war in Ukraine as well. So it possibly didn't take all those challenges that we couldn't have foreseen into account. And the result uh, was that we didn't see any bidders in that round, but for offshore wind, though other, other projects were successful, of course, um, on solar and onshore wind. Uh, we were disappointed about that, um, but we are really pleased that uh, we've learnt the lessons from it. Um, and the next allocation round, allocation round six, will be launched next week. Uh, we've confirmed over a billion pounds of budget will be available in that round, including 800 million pounds specifically for offshore wind. Uh, so it makes it the biggest round yet, with four times more budget available to offshore wind than in the previous round. So we're very hopeful uh, that, that that round will, will now be very successful. Um, and those are indeed all the, all, all the, the signals we're hearing so far. Um, and we are trying to address some of the supply chain challenges we faced there with new funding through various programs like our Green Industries Growth Accelerator, Sustainable Industries Rewards, and so on, which you can and find details of if you're interested, uh, but lots of money and support available to try and stimulate um, investment um, in, in some of those areas. So um, that's the story from the UK. Uh, no matter what happens with the, the auctioning round that's still, I think, going on uh, as we speak um, in Norway, uh, there's a huge amount that we can do together, the UK and Norway. That was why we signed the Green Industrial Partnership. Uh, and it's part of why you are here today and we're really keen to engage with you on all of that. So I think that's it from me. I hope it's going to be a really good uh, morning uh, and then a very nice lunch. And I think with that, I'm handing over to Arne.
Yes, from BP. Thank you very much. I'm handing over. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, and thank you for hosting this uh, great event with us, and also the British Embassy staff. Great uh, to work with you. And as you mentioned, this is the second time we do this, so it's already a tradition, I guess. Uh, that's nice. So, um, my name is Arne Jungmann. I am a head of country for BP in Norway. And um, we created this to, to make some space to, for industry leaders, policymakers, and uh, analysts to, um, to have a discussion and, uh, uh, about and opportunities and not the least challenges with the green um, shift or the energy transition. So, um, so that's the purpose of, uh, of these events. And uh, a little bit about BP. What are BP doing in Norway? Uh, some of you that uh, might be old enough to remember the BP uh, petrol stations back in the old days. They were sold and rebranded to Norol and then Statoil and then Circle K. It still feels uh, like, uh <laughs> like good old BP stations. But that's uh, obviously a business that we are not in anymore. But we are in four different areas in, um, in Norway. So uh, one area is um, that we are, as you know, the up upstream oil and gas business is um, no longer something we do alone, but that is merged into Aker BP. And uh, we are the second biggest owner of Aker BP. No prices to guess who is the biggest owner, but, uh, but that's, um, that's a big, great company. So Aker BP, we are very proud to be a part of it. Uh, second area is um, aviation fuels. So we are a major player in aviation fuels in, in Norway. Uh, we are actually at um, serving 46 airports in Norway, which is uh, three more than Avinor. So that's a little fun fact right there. <laughs> and, um, and we were also together with Avinor and SAS and a few others. We were the first to introduce um, sustainable aviation fuel, SAF, in, uh, in Norway back in 2016. That was a, a good project. Southwest Aviation. Third uh, area is uh, lubricants. So we are a major player in the lubricant mar market through Castrol. Castrol is a 100% BP brand. And um, since we are in Norway, uh, the country with by far the most electric vehicles per capita, uh, we can mention that Castrol has also uh, come up with a product called Castrol On, which is helping uh, extending battery life and and um, range for electric vehicles. That's another little fun fact. And finally, the fourth area is uh, our ambitions within renewable energy. And that's why we're here today. Uh, that's the main topic. And um, that includes offshore wind. And on the topic of offshore wind, I think we might as well mention, as everyone knows there's an, off there's an auction going on. Um, and I'm very glad that that auction is already, we can deem it to be a success now. So uh, it will be, it will happen. And regardless of who wins the, the auction, uh, SN2 will be built. We will be starting the offshore wind adventure in Norway. So that's very good news and that's very good for Norway. It's very good for the offshore wind industry. And that's all I'm going to say about SN2 because that was never planned to be part of this event. This event is forward looking and we don't need to look very far ahead because there are already three new licenses coming up next year and hopefully 17 more in the years to come after that. So there's plenty of opportunities, or I think as one of the, one was mentioning last, in last event, it's like a mosquito on a nudie beach. So uh, plenty of opportunities. And uh, <laughs> with that, I think I'll hand it over to, back to Mona. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure that image will stick with everybody after this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam Ambassador and Anna, for this great introduction. Uh, we do have an exciting program ahead of us today. Uh, for uh, part one, we will be looking more overall on uh, the road to a sustainable future. And then we will we'll break around 10. And then we will dive into the offshore wind beyond 2025, as Arna said. There is an auction going on and nobody knows how long it will last. So um, we will now, for part one, have four introductions, followed by a conversation on what a sustainable future looks like in Norway and what investments are needed. And to bring some of the European experiences, we are very proud to have the senior vice president of VP in Europe and head of country in the UK, Louise Kingham with us today. She leads BP in the UK and the continental Europe 
integrating BP's business activities. She represents BP in this region and works to identify opportunities to deliver decarbonized energy solutions at scale. And before joining BP, she was the CEO of the Energy Institute for 22 years, professional membership body for people who work across the world of energy. Welcome to the stage. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm delighted that introduction was just long enough to forget about Arnie's image <laughs> as I took to the stage, because the two things together may, may be, maybe not a good idea. But um, I am I'm delighted to have, have, have run across from Dusseldorf last night to be here with you today. Uh, and I think my, my job is to give a little bit of a flavor of uh, how potentially BP can be uh, a, an active part, partner and supporter in the journey that we are on here in Norway, which, as you've already heard set out this morning, is a, is a, is a really exciting one. Uh, and, and also not the easiest of journeys in many places, not, not just here, but it is one certainly that we as a, as a company are very up for. So in the next few minutes, it's, it's my intention to just give you a little bit of a flavor of, uh, as, as you heard from, from our host, this morning, some of the things that we are attempting to do and, and, and support uh, in terms of moving our societies uh, towards a net zero future, alongside, of course, providing the very much needed energy that is a requirement for here and now, uh, because we can't stop uh, doing that either. It is genuinely a transition. And our length of, of bilateral partnership uh, with Norway, between Norway and the UK, is testament to that. It's been uh, close over 120 years. Uh, BP was there at the beginning uh, as in terms of energy, and that starts with UK coal exports, if we go right the way back, uh, between 19, just over after 1900 up to the 1960s. And from then, of, obviously, of course, we talk about the North Sea. That's what we first think of, possibly, uh, more so than uh, where we started. Signed agreements way back then, just as we've heard about uh, more recently. The UK being a major export destination for Norwegian oil and gas, of course, uh, and a very solid partnership that gives UK energy security, which has become, obviously, as you have uh, reflected on already this morning, increasingly important. Then, of course, we moved to liberalisation of energy markets, uh, learning from each other by doing in, uh, in, in that regard. And I, I would say, certainly as I go around Europe uh, in doing the day job that I now do uh, more recently, I think there is much envy and uh, high regard for the liberalisation and uh, the opportunities that have been created here in Norway by having a very flexible power market, as well as a pretty clean one too. Uh, there are many other markets in, uh, in our geography, just the part that I work in, but actually globally, where we are not so rich in natural resources and market opportunities as we have been here. So again, another real success story, always with more to do, of course. And then we move into the journey more solidly around our renewable energy pathways, as we've already started to talk about, uh, with that energy treaty of 2021 uh, and creating that investment and trading platform to be able to uh, develop our North Sea wind potential, as we've already started to reflect on this morning and look forward to beyond 2025. And of course, we then have more opportunities layered on top of that when we think about the role, the wider role that the North Sea can play in respect of building out the grid opportunities, uh, further expansion of the offshore wind, and then we think about the removal of CO2 and the introduction of hydrogen. And you can start to see that there is a, a grid of the future alongside the grids of today that we're a little bit more familiar with. And there is a real opportunity for us to collaborate uh, with that richness in the geology and the resources that we have uh, around our coastlines, there is a real opportunity for us to do some of that, which requires some intense collaboration, not least because it's not inexpensive to do, uh, but actually together we have the skills, the, the technical capability, the engineering know-how, the science, as well as the commercial acumen to be able to put some of this, hopefully, to work for benefit of citizens of our respective nations. 
So that's the journey that BP is going on. We have a net zero commitment out to 2050 or before. We would like to get there as soon as possible, but we recognize we absolutely need to keep providing the energy for today alongside moving everyone on this journey together. This is more complicated. We were talking about it when we were having a cup of coffee before we came in and saying, actually, this is more difficult than what we've done for the last 100 years because we have to take everyone, we have to go in lockstep together. Governments, regulators, business partners, engineering companies, supply chain businesses, customers, all got to move through this transition in a way that makes sense for us all and in a way we can all commit to, which means, frustratingly, occasionally, it might feel like it's going a bit slower than, uh, than it could do, but it's, it's equally understandable. I came from the not-for-profit world, as you had heard in the introduction, wagging my finger at the energy sector, telling it to do better and go faster. Uh, and then I went to the other side. And I went purposefully to the other side, quite late in a career, having done that for nearly three, three decades, because I could see the opportunity that was presented by making sure we could provide energy for citizens today while we built out the energy systems of the future. And that, that needs to happen at scale, of course, which I know a lot of us in the room recognise. So that's the global strategy that we have. We are making some progress as a company, but there's a huge amount to do. We're only just at the very beginning. We've got clear targets around scope one, two, and three emissions reductions, uh, and a number of other aims that, that reinforce the, the role that we want to pay in terms of our part in the transition, whilst we also to continue to provide the energy that is so important for today as we go through this journey, and we move our workforce and our communities along with us at the same time. There are particular areas that we are significantly investing, which we've moved uh, towards. I think last year we invested about 23% of our total capex globally as a company in, uh, in lower carbon technologies. And there are certain areas of focus for us, obviously offshore wind uh, and renewable power, solar, solar power additionally are, are one of those. Hydrogen, I've mentioned, blue and green. Uh, is, 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 is happening in different parts of, of the world in which we operate. Uh, and certainly within, within the UK, I can give a couple of examples of progress we're making there. Uh, bioenergy, you've already had some mention of SAF. Uh, that's been around for a little while, but again, there's the opportunity to really scale that up. Uh, and EV infrastructure uh, rollout so that we can provide customers uh, as we've already heard, many customers here, uh, and not, uh, not quite so many elsewhere in the world, but again, certain markets where that is growing quite quickly, and we want to be able to provide people with fast and ultra-fast charging experiences so that it's a great customer experience as you, as you transition uh, from one form of mobility to another. Uh, and also in respect of the, the obviously the jet fuel that Arne mentioned, we're already supplying jet fuel into 300 locations across Europe, and there's the opportunity to scale SAF and be able to do that much more so uh, beyond some of the initial fantastic partnerships we've had. But all of that relies on safety first in everything that we do and a lot of engineering excellence to deliver these large-scale projects, as I know some of you and some of you as our partners in the room will appreciate. And, and that's where, you know, when we come back to thinking about offshore wind, we have some capability as an oil and gas company of 100 plus years to be able to do things at scale, build big stuff, big bits of kit. Uh, we understand subsurface, we understand deep sea. So there are certain things we can bring to those partnerships, but we also welcome the opportunity to work with, with others who have already done this, tried and tested and built capability. And we've been fortunate enough to do that both in partnership, but also in ways where we are bringing new talent into the organization to m merge those experiences so that we can play our part and contribute as well. Um, we have recently, uh, well, recently, almost a bit like you, it's not that recent, but a year or so ago, uh, fast approaching, last summer, actually, we uh, won an auction for four gigawatts of offshore wind in Germany as the first big, big couple of projects that we've got in, in Europe, in addition to the uh, gigawatts we've already got in the UK, uh, which are working rapidly through the quite long process, as we understand, of getting offshore wind <laughs> built. Um, and though that's just the beginning for us, the beginning of the journey. And so we really do relish the opportunity, welcome the fact that 
it, the auctions have commenced, that the fact that there will be more of those, and it's a long journey. You know, not all of us will be participating in every one of those. We, we go through cycles with this, just as we've seen in our experience in the, in the UK uh, and Germany and in other parts of the world too. Uh, so it's, it's a really exciting opportunity. In Spain and Portugal, uh, I'll give you another example of something that we're doing. Uh, we are investing in uh, around 11,000 rapid charging points uh, in, the, in that peninsula to be able to, to spend around about probably a billion euros, all told, on building out the infrastructure across Spain and, uh, and Portugal in partnership with Ibedrola. Another fantastic way of bringing our skill sets together and our expertise together as two, as two significant companies, both invested in that part of, uh, of, of Europe and wanting to be able to do something together in, in service of, of customers. And also one of the other things that we'll be looking to do with them, hopefully through furthering the joint ventures, is to build out the capability for generating more renewable power so that we can be sure that that's green electrons that are helping the EVs to do the job that they do for each of us uh, in terms of mobility and the ability, obviously, to cut emissions. So the power of partnership is really important. Uh, and you know, somebody's already referenced the lessons from... Uh, the invasion of, of the Ukraine in terms of what that's done for inflation, for price spikes and so on. Uh, and, it, and it has put more challenge into the transition and moving towards net zero alongside doing and providing the energy resources that we need to today. So it does mean actually, and we were having again this conversation over coffee, we've got to work harder to make this a cost effective and an affordable transition for everybody. That's not going to be easy. Uh, alongside going in lockstep together, it's quite a challenge. Uh, but I think you wouldn't be sat in this room if you weren't interested or up for that challenge. Uh, so in that sense, I'm very much delighted to be amongst you uh, and, and hope that we'll be able to have some discussion about what some more of those opportunities could look like. Because the whole of Europe is going on this journey uh, and they can't do it, actually, without UK and Norway playing its part. Uh, and I'm sure you will be familiar with those opportunities. We were again talking about some of them before we came in in respect of future uh, for CO2 storage, uh, for hydrogen networks, for obviously advancing the, the, the uh, development of offshore wind and the interconnectivity that there needs to be between all of these systems and the integration between these systems so that we provide energy in the most efficient way over the long term. So that's a real opportunity for us. If we can get the regulatory frameworks and the standards right in order in which to invest in systems that work across geographies uh, and basins, then we will be in, in really good shape. And that is our opportunity to work together as partners in business, as partners with government, with regulators, with trade organisations and membership associations, with NGOs and the community from which I came. Uh, ultimately, so that we do this and go on this journey together because it's hugely important for the societies that we serve. So with that, I look forward to hearing from everybody uh, else this morning and joining in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. It was very interesting hearing about your experiences and all the, all the great work you were doing. Uh, now, our next presenter uh, is a very seasoned energy advisor delivering reports and analysis to both companies and governments. Now, looking into global energy transition and how will it will impact us, please welcome CEO of Rista Energy, Jaran Rista. Yes, so... Uh, you, you may... S you may s <laughs> unless you need this one, please stand in the middle. If, if okay, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, can you see my slides even? Maybe you can get that section removed. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so um, yes, I will start to, to with a very big picture of the energy transition with a 300 years of energy history. And this is one, one of my favorite slides, and it's a lot of messages here. So basically what you see from 10 exajoule of energy consumption in 1800 until uh, 550 in 2100. Um, what is surprising for many is it will be a peak energy and a decline of primary energy. And how can that happen? 
when we have a growing population, growing GDP, because apparently energy consumption has been growing with, uh, with the GDP, hasn't it? Well, the key can be explained. I will take you through the journey now to understand why this will happen. And imagine your car. If you have a gasoline car, you can drive, you, you usually use five to six liters per 100 kilometer, agree? And one liter of gasoline, that's 36 mega -yule, you might remember from school, or 10 kilowatt hours. So 10 kilowatt hours get you 17 kilometers. Uh, with an electric car, how far do you get with 10 kilowatt hours? Well, you remember when you're driving your electric car that typically you have 17 to 18, 19, maybe 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometer. Meaning for 10, you get 50 to 60 kilometers. So we get three times the service with electricity than what you get with chemical energy. And the convention we have is to denote the primary energy with the chemical content of the molecules, oil, gas, and coal. So this energy transition will not only be a revolution in, 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 uh, in, in, in the, the sources of energy, but Implicitly in that is the biggest revolution in energy efficiency ever. So all the end user segments, as you see, they will get increased access to energy, even if the primary energy is going to peak and decline. But of course, this requires that we get a shift from molecules to electrons and electrons that we are harvesting directly from the nature. So we see the gray part, the losses is going to be much smaller in the future. Still quite some losses from heating of batteries and from uh, biomass burning, but much less than the losses we have today. So <coughs> when we s still have this very long picture from uh, over 300 years, very compressed time scale, we see that solar and wind, and to some degree biomass, geothermal and hydro, will basically push coal, oil and gas out of the market. And this is also the way to use the words, push it out, outcompete it. So we don't create energy transition from stopping oil, gas and coal. If you try to do that before you have the alternatives, you will only create disruption and market turbulence. So you need to, the, the energy transition is going to happen before, because we are, first we are investing in these new energy forms and then the market forces will take care of basically outcompeting and, and taking coal, oil and gas off of the market. And also remember when you see charts like this, that only half of the energy, approximately or even less, from gas, oil and coal is useful energy that the end users will, will, will have a benefit of using. But 90% of this energy, uh, well, not, not for the biomass, but for solar and wind, is going to be useful. So then you see actually that it is an increasing access to energy implicitly also in this chart. And then one note on solar. Because what has surprised me most over the last even three months, wrapping up 2023, is the pace of the growth of solar. We expected it to grow from 210 gigawatt in 2022 to 250 gigawatt installed in, in 2023. It ended up at 444 gigawatt DC, meaning about 350 gigawatt when it's in integrated in the, in the grid much more than anticipated. And more than that, the capacity to produce solar panels seems now to be four times higher than that. And solar has then the potential to be a true disruptive technology. And what is a disruptive technology? Well, it's a new and better technology that is better and cheaper and that will create creative destruction of all the f previous technologies. Look at diesel electric locomotives, out-competing uh, steam uh, locomotives. Look at the CD player, out-competing vinyl uh, players. And then streaming, out-competing out CDs. So the old technologies is completely taken away from the market because they are more expensive. And at least for south of 55 degrees globally, solar has that potential. It will be integrated in all building components and will be cheaper in combination with batteries than 
all other thermal sources, for example. So it will, will not make sense to build any thermal, uh, thermal power plants in the 2030s, 40s and 50s. So we have the potential to have a disruptive technology in solar. Wind will not to the same degree have the potential to be truly disruptive, but it will be part of the mix and it will be competitive in the part of the mix. So it's big changes uh, happening. Um, okay, and then to Europe. Europe has, has had this ambition to be 45% renewable by 2030. Now it's taking down to 42.5, but still very ambitious. And uh, offshore wind is a very key part of that. And as you see, these, these uh, head of states are uh, reiterating and, and stating this ambition uh, about a year ago in Austin, in April uh, last year, to get to 300 gigawatt. You know, all hydropower in Norway is 30 gigawatt. So it's 10 times the capacity of the Norwegian hydropower. That is the ambition. Uh, and on the way, uh, it will be 120 gigawatt already in 2030 is the ambition. And more than that, the ambition is made in Europe. Uh, so will they be able to do this? Um, well, here we have stated all the targets for each of the countries. And then our assessment of where they will be in 2030. So these are the 2030 targets. Adding all of these country targets, you will land at 150. The Aust and the ambition is 120, and the aggregated realistic assessment we had a year ago was 115. Now we are slightly below that, but not much, uh, maybe 110, because, for example, the, as mentioned, the AR5 in, in UK was, was quite disappointing, didn't, turn to, didn't bring some of the risk volumes we have. So we think that this will happen, but what about the supply chain? Will it be able to deliver? And we did uh, this, this report, and you can all download this report from, from internet. We made it uh, for Wind Europe a year ago. Then we went through the full supply chain, you know, all the ports, all the vessels, all the turbine manufacturing, etc., and tried to flag whether Europe will be able to deliver. Because I said the ambition is made in Europe. It shouldn't be based on import of China, uh, Chinese technology. But what has happened also in the wind turbine market, and the wind blade market is that Chinese um, companies has grown from 20% to 60% market share globally within the last 10 years. So China is able to offer uh, cheaper turbines, um, but the turbines is only a small part of the complete supply chain. So we, we looked at all of this on the turbine supply chain, on the towers, on the foundations, and on the vessels and made assessment of exactly how much is needed to deliver on this, and what, is, what kind of actions do we need to see, uh, and where, <coughs> where can we just lean back and say all the capacity is in place? Well, maybe for two of the areas we see that, for the others we really see that there's a need for, to ramp up quite fast. But we are seeing that this ramping up is happening, and we are seeing that the target is get, getting slightly less ambitious, so we are seeing, and also we are seeing that the, the wind um, inflation is, is going down. So we see that it, it will actually, uh, we, we, it could be possible to deliver on this. And for example, on the turbines, one of the big problems has been that we have been ever building bigger and bigger turbines. So the old supply chain with the vessels uh, are too small and, and, and we have to build new vessels, adding to a lot of cost. Now it seems that both Vestas, GE, um, and Siemens are landing at about 15 gigawatt, uh, 15 megawatt turbines, which will create some stability in the supply chain, and hopefully that these vessels will be able to to, de to deliver be uh, and and live out their kind of life, the generation of technologies, and not that we have to build uh, build new capacity immediately. So also taking down the cost. So we are fairly optimistic that we are, will be quite close to the OST and the declaration of 120 uh, gigawatt actually installed. Also my, just last, in, in addition to the wind, I think we have so many opportunities with creativity because we need, it, with 100 and, uh, or, or 300 gigawatt of wind in the North Sea, we will have, the surrounding markets will often only ask for 120, 130 gigawatt. 
So what should we do with 130 gigawatt or 170 gigawatt that nobody is asking for when the wind is really blowing? Well, we have to do something with it. We can produce hydrogen. Maybe we can reuse hydrogen from existing platforms and uh, do, do the geological storage. Maybe we can have combined oil and gas production and uh, so combined even green and blue uh, on some of the platforms. Build pipelines, you know, we can have the CO2 injection pipelines, etc. So all of this infrastructure can maybe be used if you are creative and, and do the right kind of business development. So there's huge, huge opportunities for the North Sea to also leverage existing infrastructure. And I think we haven't really, really seen these opportunities yet. And also we expect a lot of new innovation. This is, this is just one, one example taking down the cost using very cheap and heavy old-fashioned kind of turbines instead of these very uh, very expensive slim turbines that is needed in in in, in the standard uh, wind, wind um, uh, constructions today leaning over like a sailboat uh, to uh, to need less structural integrity etc these are only one example we will see a lot of radical innovation taking down the cost and making most likely offshore wind a very profitable business in the 2030s. So let me round off there. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. Um, next, we will have a presenter looking from the NGO side of things, from an organization that is in the forefront of pushing the net zero agenda with a knowledge based and analytic approach to the climate issue, as they present themselves as. So what is actually needed to ensure a sustainable Norway? Please welcome to the stage CEO of CERO, Sigrun Jalob. Osla. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. So what is needed to make Norway a sustainable economy? I have seven minutes. I do actually <laughs> have a recipe for that. Uh, and it's not as hard as you may think. We're launching every year, and next time, April 24th, note the date, uh, reports where we go through everything that's needed to actually reach the Norwegian climate targets. Um, we need to cut emissions in the big emission sectors. That's petroleum, industry, transport, waste, and agriculture. Um, and the good news is, it's not real. There are some things, some things that, are, that are not really hard. Uh, we do have the technology, the UN Climate Panel says the same thing, to actually have emission by 2030. We don't need any new technology. The technology comes at a premium, which requires policy, but the te technology is there. It also is not that expensive. We've estimated the costs of our proposals. Uh, last year, everything that needs to be done by government by 2030 it's a, it has a cost of 65 billion kroners. Some people think that's a lot of money. You guys probably don't. Um, <laughs> we're going to spend 50 billion on just the on new offices for the government. Uh, the CO2 tax, which is going to increase, uh, and that's great news, it's going, to, it's going to generate 178 billion kroners by 2030 for the state budget. Uh, so on balance, it's not a lot of money. We also know more or less exactly what we need to do in terms of policy. The bad news is, uh, the difficult part is, first of all, was what, what, what Louise also was talking about, there is a lot that has to do with getting in lockstep, getting the ducks in a row, um, has to do with getting biofuels produced and used in aviation, getting hydrogen produced and used in the shipping sector, um, and getting all those things happening fast at the same time, uh, and we don't have a lot of time, so that's difficult. Um, I think one other difficult thing is the increasing fear of the people. Um, and when I say that, I mean the whole discussion about green lash. Yes, there are protests now in Europe. Um, if you look at the core of those protests, they have much less to do with climate policy than they have to do with hundreds of other things. Pressure coming from prices of food following uh, the, the war in Ukraine, energy prices, inequality, all kinds of frustrations that lead to protests. Uh, in Norway, we've cut emissions by less than 5%. I think the main frustration has to do with lack of trust in the government actually meaning business when it comes to climate policy. 25% of Norwegians think that uh, the government is doing what it has promised in terms of climate policy, and that's not very impressive. Um, the third big problem, of course, uh, is power, access to power. Uh, and we're going to have already seeing a um, great 
limitations in terms of transmission, and we're going to see limitations in terms of access to sufficient renewable energy to fuel the green shift, because as you know, 50% of the energy we're currently using is fossil. So what I'm going to just end on is, my concern is that we have to not just do a trans addition of renewable energy and of the things that are currently growing, we also have to make a transition from the fossil economy. Now the government is keeps saying that we're going to build the green economy on the shoulders uh, of the fossil. That sounds great. Um, what we and there's a big discussion at the moment of whether or not we need a plan to do that. Do we have a sufficient plan to do that? Um, in 1970-71, we made the greatest, still I think, the greatest policy document in Norwegian history when we planned how to actually manage the oil resources, how to make investments. It cost a lot of money. Uh, how to manage that, how to secure the distribution of the, of the gains of that. Um, last year, we had a report from a climate commission that said, uh, we need a plan to actually transition out of the fossil economy, uh, and we need to make people feel more, more secure that there's going to be a job for them at the other end. Last uh, couple of weeks ago, WWF and some other organizations published this report that said, what we also know, our main market for petroleum resources has already decided that it's not going to use much oil and gas in a few decades. So um, we are risking at the moment that we spend a lot of people, competence and capital on keeping uh, search for oil and gas when what we really need to spend our efforts on is to get the transition going and get going with producing renewable energy. So what are three very quick advices that we have to the government um, that I think need to be part of that plan? First of all, getting started on offshore wind, and this week was great news. I made this presentation before the auction started, but we're very happy to see that there are actually bidders in the auction. A lot of people were uh, trying to scare us and say that that was not going to happen. Uh, but in order to actually reach our climate goals before 2030, there is no other way than also electrifying platforms offshore. Um, that is going to take a lot of energy. We need a fast track also for two reasons to actually supply power to electrifying platforms, and also to get costs coming down, we need to get started on offshore wind relatively quickly. We need a fast track before 2030 um, to get started on offshore wind, and also to show that it is possible to cut emissions offshore in the oil and gas sector without uh, taking all the power away from other things that we do need to do onshore in terms of transport and industry, um, and without getting the backlash of people being too angry about the power prices going forward. Who is paying for this? Well, imagine if we had a very profitable industry on which we were building this new green economy uh, that we could tap into. Uh, that would be great. Um, and we do, actually. Uh, so I think we need to be much more creative and much more forward-leaning in terms of finding a way to make that very profitable business pay for the, hopefully, le gradually less expensive offshore wind, but it's still very expensive. Is there anything we can do? Some actors want a CO2 fund. I know that um, there are many, many people in the government not liking the, the idea of CO2 funds. Um, there are other options we could think of. The oil sector could, could pay higher prices for PPAs in the power sector. We need to make sure that we're using this incredible revenue from the oil and gas sector to actually get started on the new things. Also, um, second thing, we need to get started on CO2 capture and storage. There are two specific things that we can do to get started. One th thing is that we think the government needs this very specific target for storage capacity. This is another duck in a row lockstep problem. To actually st capture, you need to know that there is a place to store. Uh, and predictability and storage availability is going to be key to get started on CO2 removal. Second, there needs to be some sort of auction or ca carbon removal reverse tax where it is profitable um, sooner to capture C uh, CO2. Third, there's a big discussion on blue hydrogen, and we haven't landed on this. We have included blue hydrogen in our plan to reach the targets for 2030 because there is no way around it, but we need to be very specific about what responsibility do exporters of blue hydrogen have? How much do we actually, what does it take for it to be blue? How much do you actually need to capture to say that you're making blue hydrogen? Um, 
And how do we build an economy where we use blue hydrogen without that being just an excuse for further exploration um, of new fields that we know the carbon budget doesn't have room for? So with that, thank you. No, it's 24 October, but more importantly, 24th of April when we're launching the new plan to reach our climate goals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sigrun. Um, for our final presentation, before we have a conversation, we will dive into the development of green aviation and what role this can play for a sustainable future. And to do this, I am happy to introduce Andreas Kolbe Ox. He has been in the aviation business for many years, working for many Norwegian av aviators, such as Vidra, SAS, and Norwegian. Until recently, he was the CEO of the air mobility business incubator Vidra Zero. Andreas Ox, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Let's try to get this up again, because then you won't see my notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, my name is Andreas, um, and I'm now representing a newly started company called Wingman. We assist, like Wingman do, uh, existing and new operators on their uh, transition to next generation aircraft technology, which includes a sustainable focus on, on more novel propulsion systems, but also autonomy, drones you've heard. Um, very relevant recently in the field of Ukraine, but also relevant to logistics operations and surveillance on the West Coast. Um, before that, already mentioned, I worked eight years in Vidra, uh, four years in PwC, and also a few years in investment banking before that. So, but my, my passion is in aviation, and I'm planning to remain here for some time. Um, it will certainly take time before the majority of aircraft has become zero emission. But the journey has also certainly started. Uh, and it starts, I believe, with a smaller aircraft and drones flying shorter distances, which is, of course, very relevant to Norway, not to say the UK, uh, with its extensive network of airports and small societies along the coast. The developments are short-term driven by the need for decarbonization, already uh, discussed here today, where sustainable aviation fuel can do a lot, but where new technology, uh, such as hydrogen and hydrogen electrics, will have to do the rest. Long-term, I believe this is more a question about energy efficiency, where the more energy efficient solutions wins long-term. I like the calculus from Rysta, uh, and if you look at the value chain in aviation, you'll see a similar picture. If you look at the value chain from what we say, from the source to trust or to propulsion, all the way from where energy comes from till you have trust behind your, your aircraft, you'll see that you fly two times longer if you're using hydrogen versus e-fuels or ESAF. And if you could use batteries, you would fly six or seven times longer. But as we all know, it's very difficult to have an aircraft flying with batteries longer than very short distances because of weight. But long-term, energy efficiency will be key. What's also interesting is that with these new technologies, uh, we see the potential for new mobility. And it, in addition to more sustainable aircraft, we also see new aircraft concepts that can do new tricks. With UK's vertical aerospace, as an example of that, uh, they're developing an aircraft which can take off and land vertically, like a helicopter. We've seen this within the military space already with fighter jets doing that trick. Now this is coming to more segments. Imagine what that can do to mobility along the coast of Norway, <coughs> along the coast of UK, and elsewhere where you have island societies. This transition takes time, and it involves many stakeholders, from those providing electricity and hydrogen to airports, to regulatory bodies certifying the aircraft, and many in between. But we do expect that the first concepts to fly within Norway in the years to come will be operated by some of the existing helicopter operators or new companies wanting to disrupt that market. It may not start with those replacing those heavy-duty S-92 Sikorsky helicopters flying in and out to the oil fields, 
but for more ease emissions along the coast, easier logistic operations. By mentioning the West Coast helicopter market, I'm aware that I may have also indicated that the next generation aircraft perhaps is not for everyone, at least in the beginning. Well, to that, I'd say that with Tesla or even with Vidra, it all started with a niche before it became a solution for everybody. Tesla sold sport car. Vidra did actually taxi flights to summer houses and winter houses in the mountains when they started. And eventually, this became something for everybody. If we have, and also talking about what Sigrid mentioned, building on the shoulders of what we have, when we have these wealthy companies on the West Coast using helicopters extensively today, and perhaps even more so if we get wind farms built everywhere, there is a potential that we can use this as a stepping stone to get this started. And I don't think there is anything wrong with that, using a niche to build a market and then expand when we bring the price points down. Talking about price points, we're looking at one third of a helicopter when we operate a, an all electric drone or any of these new advanced air mobility concepts, which is also a, a, a good potential for um, better, better financial performance. So perhaps wind farms could be serviced by and surveilled by zero emission aircraft and drones instead of helicopters. I'm just putting it out there. Thank you, Andreas. Now I would like to invite all the panelists to come up and we will have a conversation. And thank you all for sharing your insights. I mean, you have covered a lot of different perspectives. Uh, and um, now we want to have a conversation. So feel free to give me a sign and, and we'll, we'll get the conversation going. And I'll try to divide the time uh, among you. Um, Sigan, you touched upon this because in Norway, the whole discussion on renewable energy has been becoming more and more heated. You talked about the fear of people, um, even though there might be different reasons why people are scared uh, and are protesting. We see in Norway there is a resistance, strong resistance against onshore wind, at least in the public. Uh, there is criticism against the industry getting public funding for uh, such as offshore wind and high hopes that Nuclear power is the new answer uh, to our energy needs. Now, in, in this climate, is it even possible to accelerate the road towards a sustainable future? Yes. Well, I can <laughs> elaborate. <laughs> I think this, I mean, uh, the fear of people I was, I was trying to convey, I think it's exaggerated, and I think we shouldn't be that worried. And I hear politicians saying, we need to make sure we don't move too fast on this green transition because people will get angry. I don't think people are angry about that. I think more people are angry about nothing happening. Um, and if you look at, yes, there's a lot of resistance, particularly against onshore winds, which is understandable when you look at how we did it in the first few years. Uh, but actually, more people are now in favor of onshore wind than against on off onshore wind. And I think it has to do also with the level of voice uh, and the style of debate sometimes on, on one of those sides. Uh, and that's also something we have to do something about. Uh, the, the major parties, two of them are on stage here later today, I think they have an enormous responsibility towards their local representatives to help them manage that debate and, and to help them with facts and, and, how, and also with better tools to actually build renewable energy in the way that is more compliant with nature. So I'm not so concerned with that. There's also this... Uh, notion that the, the green shift is very expensive and we're making, spending so much money on offshore winds. We spent a lot of money on getting the oil sector up and going. Um, and if you compare the costs of, of climate uh, policies that we need to put in place, they're really not that expensive. Do though we remember that though? The, or the, the investments we made in oil and gas? Right. No, but I think the challenge is, is more uh, like it was then that this is a new thing. So costs that are t rolling over and we spend them every year are, are much 
easier to defend. Mm. Uh, and, and it may be naive, but I think that if we could get started on some very visible and, and effective climate policies and showing that this is actually happening, uh, I think it would be easier. But mm. if people see that it's just talk and nothing is happening, uh, the debate is, is, is becoming more complicated. Right. So my advice to politicians would at least be, don't be so worried about that. There's so many things you can do that don't bother people that much. They just make life, make life more comfortable and easier. And nobody uh, is against electrical vehicles anymore. Uh, Louise, uh, you, you indicated uh, that you know, the transition going from a nonprofit saying we need to go faster, uh, and now you're uh, in the this industry. Seat, to this seat. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, ha has your perspective changed at all? No. No. No, but I'll elaborate. <laughs> um, I completely agree. I think that the, uh, you touched on it when you were speaking about people are frustrated, they're fed up, but it's not really about this. There'll be a core who are concerned about this conversation, but actually the issues are much broader and, and therefore, um, and, and I think that's, that's where the problem of, of not enough political will into this conversation and certainly into the decision making to drive us more quickly, that, that's why that is challenged because there's just a nervousness and, and with half the planet going to the ballot box, there is a reason to be nervous if you are looking to win elections and, 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 and run governments and the like. So I get it. It doesn't change my perspective of having wagged my finger from the outside and then had the privilege of coming inside a large organisation to try and go faster. Um, it just gives me another perspective to understand the challenge. But, uh, and I think the other challenge is that when we built oil and gas industries a century ago, people were not that interested in what we were doing. And we certainly didn't worry ultimately about the customer particularly. Mm. And we didn't need the customer to really come with us. They were going to just have it happen to them uh, and, and be grateful recipients of the products and the, 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 the fruits of the lab labors. With the energy transition, we do actually need to create demand mm. at the same time as produce the supply and get the economic, get it to balance so that it's cost effective. And that means the customer's got to come with us. Uh, and that is, that's a, makes it a more of a complex challenge. But it, it, it's absolutely one we can do. Yeah, and from, from your perspective, working with analysis, and now we have all these elections going on this year, uh, <laughs> are we actually going to progress? Or will it be a setback when it comes to renewable energy? Yes, we, we have actually done, done an analysis of the 64 countries with elections this year. And the big picture is that the big red flag is with America. The United States with have two, two point zero, uh, Trump 2.0. And also uh, as a very large emitter. But we think that the Inflation Reduction Act will survive Trump. Several arguments is that you know, the wind and the solar states are Republican states. And they're benefiting a lot from the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm. Uh, and also other reasons, even if uh, Trump will probably stop EV subsidies immediately, etc. Still, we think that the green transition will survive because inertia in the transition itself, you know, is basically the cheapest technology for yeah. in most applications. So why should you take something that is more expensive? So, and all the other countries globally, uh, you know, the, the big, big picture there is on the margin, it will be slightly better for the green transition. You know, look at Mexico. The, the Claudia, the new president candidate, is a, actually an energy intellectual herself. And you could go on Indonesia, India, etc. You have some right-wing and right populistic parties in Europe that could have a much bigger uh, position in the EU parliament. But also, you know, even Gert Wilder in, in, uh, in Netherlands hasn't been able to change anything of the policies there yet. So we think also even with 130 seats in the Euro parliament, uh, that that the, the the green transition will go on, gone on, maybe in a slightly lower speed uh, in Europe. So it will survive these these elections. It will survive, Andreas. How does it look from your perspective? Well, uh, talking about America and and the customer uh, and who's going to pay for this. Um, last week I attended a panel in in the U.S. Uh, hosted by one of the air, aircraft manufacturer Embraer. And we talked about this because the green transition is going to come at a cost uh, in the beginning. And then eventually we will hopefully see a picture where this is actually the more commercially viable solution um, because technology is cheaper and you're using less energy and so on. 
but it's all about this kind of getting over the first lump to get started. And um, one thing which strikes me is that we, we at least, and now I'm talking on behalf of aviation, I'm not sure if it's, if it's the same everywhere, but uh, we don't know enough about the customer. We, we have our we, we make assumptions based on what we think they want to do, but when you go out and ask them, you may get a different answer. So uh, when we're talking about willingness to pay and so on, okay, how much are you willing to pay to reduce your carbon emission? Mm. People may say that they want to pay a lot, but do they ultimately want to do that when they're going on holiday with their family? Good question. I think we, we need to be realistic here. Somebody has to pay. It has to be the customer or the taxpayer. Um, and it might be a, a slight difference between the US and, and Europe in that regard. Um, therefore, I believe it's extremely important, and this is what I pointed at when I did my, my short uh, introduction. We need to look for those customers willing to, to help us in the beginning, in combination with politics being made to support this. So look for, for those niche markets to start with, where the willingness to pay is high, and where we can also give a good value proposition to what they have today, um, where we can replace a helicopter, uh, where we can do something which is commercially also interesting from day one. Well, speaking of, uh, of taxpayers, because, of, because this is a big part of the, the debate, and, of, and now in Norway we have some examples of there is a lot of subsidies or financial support from authorities. Batteries, one example, developing new technology. You're talking of new technology and, and, and it's, you know, rent-seeking industry mm. uh, called by some. Are you scared that some of the setbacks in that area will affect actually the technolo technological development and, and the willingness to pay for new technology? Was that a question to everybody? That was, or? Uh, well, first, Andreas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, we're, we're very much dependent on what's, what's happening in the industries around us and all the suppliers, uh, what, what they find a market. What's very complicated is that when we look at new aircraft technology and, and we look at all those uh, players involved in such a process, all the suppliers and all the regulatory bodies and so on, um, the challenge is that we, we all parties involved have to see a... a an equally bright or, a, or even better, a brighter future for their business. And in some cases, you see that one, some of the suppliers are reluctant to move over because they want to protect what they have today and so on, while others see the benefit. So it's also not only about creating some sort of a viable concept to the end customer, but also making this a viable business to all parties involved in creating that product. Uh, and this is a, a complicated thing. And, if you look at the aviation market today, you see that uh, it's a bit unbalanced, where some players make most of the profit. Um, not going to mention them, but, but some are. Um, it's not the operator, I can tell you. Um, and, and this is also something which may, should be rebalanced, and this is also what players in the market are trying to do when we're changing technology. They want to rebalance this and, and, and make sure that profit in the supply chain is more equally distributed. And that may put some off because they're in a very good position today and they just want to desperately protect it. Mm. There are some big engine manufacturers, for instance, that, that make some good profits. <laughs> Sigrid? Well, first of all, uh, my main message is that it, it really isn't that expensive. Um, so it's also possible to answer those concerns. How much money have we actually spent on batteries? It's not that much money. We're not subsidizing battery production in Norway, and, and I think that's a good thing. I, I'm glad the government says that's not something we're going to do. Uh, what we need to subsidize is charging infrastructure the additional cost of an electric truck instead of a diesel one. Uh, we need to subsidize the most expensive emission reductions in the industry because we're getting, we've done the easy part now. We're getting at the hard part. It's going to cost some money. But the overall sum is limited. It's 65 billion kroners is what we need to actually spend by 2030. And, and you can calculate it probably in different ways, but it's a fairly good estimate. And then the offshore wind comes in addition to that. Now, in terms of offshore wind, I think it's, it's important to explore how we can use the fact that a very profitable sector needs renewable energy. Uh, is there any way we can make, make that 
uh, make them pay more for the offshore wind developments. Uh, mm. I think that would be popularly important, and I think it would be fiscally important, and I think it could help actually getting us started. Now, in a, uh, what I'm more concerned about is sort of the complexity of what needs to happen to get all the ducks in a row in many places. And I, it needs to be very local decisions about transport infrastructure and getting the harbors to have charging that you can also combine with trains. And, and, and it needs, those decisions need to be made on a local level. And I don't think we've had enough attention to local level climate related decisions. And we see that just now in the debate about nature. Uh, there are so many other concerns and there is so limited uh, tools and capacity and, and actual information to make informed decisions about that, where the decisions, decisions are now going to happen, including on building renewable energy going forward. Hmm. As we're looking into both the, the UK and Norway and our collaboration, are there experiences from the UK regarding this, the willingness for government to support, the need for it, uh, for the industry to actually make the transition? Yeah, I, th I think there are some actually, um, just, just to build on that particular point, where the, the subsidies, and I can think about it in the UK, where we're building markets to create um, CCS and, and hydrogen uh, businesses. So, so the, the the bridge between what you pay, what a customer pays today and what they'll pay for what is at the moment a higher price decarbonised supply is where that subsidy should be most useful. But I think the contribution that the industry can make is to be the incumbent of the the first source of demand, yeah, so be an off taker. So, for example, uh, just to, to illustrate that. When I think about, we got, I've got four refineries in, in Europe, uh, and, and they are the cu first customers of what should be 95% plus blue hydrogen, and then ultimately green, and then they'll be producing sustainable aviation fuel and, and other co-bio co co for, for, for other things. So I think that you can start to build that value chain, and that should be a, a, something that the industry thinks about and can, can do more of. And, uh, and as Sigrun was saying, that, that that all then happens at quite a local level. So when I think about what we're doing in the UK, in, in the northeast of the UK, we're in a place called Teesside, that is working on an old industrial site of thousands and thousands, four and a half thousand acres, uh, hectares actually, of, of land, which was uh, heavy industry maybe three, four decades ago. So the local community has lost a little bit of hope that that will not be reborn again. But actually, if we bring these industries back, but we decarbonize these industries with blue, green, hydrogen, and carbon capture and storage, we create sustainable futures for chemicals companies and uh, plastics organizations and others that, that would otherwise not have a path to being viable in the longer term. We also create jobs that are uh, have not been there in that part of the world for quite some years, and we create opportunity as well as for both business, for, for the governments, and also for the communities. And I think those are, the, those are the sort of smart ways to break that complexity down a little bit and start to build almost like small ecosystems around new industries and new sectors in order to get going before you then get, to, as, as, as we've mentioned, to scale that is needed. Hmm. And, we and we're learning by doing, right? That's, that's how we're having to... We don't have time to do it any other way. We've just got to, got to get on with it. Hmm. Yeah, uh, what are, will be the most important contributions for Norway and the UK from your perspective in the, in the green transition? Yes, uh, of course, uh, offshore wind supply chain is one important contribution. Um, another is, I think, uh, what, uh, what is now being done towards German industry to, to bring hydrogen to the continent, both the technology to develop uh, blue and green hydrogen and bring it to the continent. Of course, the CO2 in, in, uh, uh, injection is already a big tourist attraction. You know, uh, everybody is going to Øygarden and, and uh, being inspired by that. So it's going to be operational by year end, isn't it? And, and uh, just need to, to get some more volumes of CO2. But uh, you know, uh, so, so that's also a technology development that is very important. So I think uh, maybe number one overall is technology development. Uh, you know, we have small companies like Alma or others developing solid state uh, high temperature uh, um, fuel cells that could even burn LNG 
to make electric uh, as a, in a fuel cell and with, with carbon capture, etc. There's a lot of technology uh, development going on. But also, with 30 gigawatt uh, of wind and maybe 50 gigawatt of wind uh, 20, 30 years from now, that is partly not correlated with the weather system in, in, in the southern uh, North Sea, it, it will also be an important balancing power uh, combined with the Norwegian uh, hydropower. So um, also directly as an energy producer, Norway can have a big contribution. Hmm. Uh, Andreas, you, you mentioned um, both Norway and UK, we have short distances where you could sort of test out new technology for aviation. Do you see us as, as test nations, both the UK and Norway? And, and is, it, is it something the industry will do or are you reliant on government funding? Uh, yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I think we need this combination and, and uh, one of the great benefits of Norway is its topography, what, what the country looks like, um, where we are um, in terms of having societies everywhere, um, not all that easy to get there. Um, because I believe strongly that we need a, a and, and to your point as well, to start small, to start with uh, business cases that make sense in the beginning, even if they need to be subsidized somewhat, or at least to have um, a more favorable taxation, uh, which would be fair if you're a zero emission or if you use any good new technology. Um, but a combination, I think we need to look for those good first use cases and be realistic about that. And, and then it scales. Um, and yes, Norway and, and UK have the benefits of, of um, many well-developed societies uh, in remote places. You can also look at the Orkney Islands. It's similar, to, but to do it. But maybe to a greater extent in Norway, you have a huge network of, of airports along the coast, and we could have had many more if it was socially acceptable to fly into, into all small societies with, with uh, more eco-friendly and, and silent aircraft. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a great potential uh, as a start market, and I think we, we need to look for that first market. And uh, we've advocated for a long time for Norway as a good test bed for new technology. Um, but now we don't have to convince anyone anymore. This is a good place to start, and, and uh, suppliers around the world see that. Norway is a good place to start, for sure. So, but where are we, some of us are maybe impatient to see when is this actually going to happen? Yeah. Uh, where are we in time? Um, if you, realistically, we will have some quite simple missions, very short, on the West Coast in two to three years, I believe. Um, but that's not going to be any, any scaled operation with many passengers. We're perhaps talking about cargo, um, flying cargo from, let's say, Stavanger to Haugesund or a bit further, uh, but it's a start. Um, they're doing a similar project on New Zealand. Air New Zealand is supporting that, uh, where they're going to do a first flight next year. So we're talking 25, 26, 27, but it's depending on regulatory bodies. Uh, when the CAA of UK and the CAA of Norway, together with the ASA, can approve these operations. But we will get started in small in this decade, and it's going to scale from 2030 and onwards. We were not really planning on opening for questions from the audience, but... Christian uh, seemed very eager either to comment or to, uh, to pose a question. So uh, please, uh, please stand up and uh, we need sound on the mic. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it, it's obvious we are, going to, we are talking about changing the whole energy system of the world from dominantly fossil to dominantly renewable. And it has to move in parallel. We cannot produce the hydrogen if there are no customers, etc. There needs to be infrastructure to distribute it. So it's obvious that this is a combination of producers, customers and infrastructure building. I think we are making big mistakes by talking about that public contribution as subsidies um, and comparing it with state budgets of schools, hospitals and whatever good reasons we have. So I think we need a different economic model where uh, all the CO2 charges coming in from the energy transition, which is a huge inflow of money, is seen as how do we spend that part to, to separate it from the state budgets of the UK, of Norway and other countries in order to get this going like an IRA in the, U in the US or whatever. That is what is needed. If we could have some comments to, to this, how do we get out of the sch schisma that Governments are criticized for whatever measures they do because it is subsidies. 
Thank you. Let's start with the Jaren, and we'll, yes, uh, we'll do the round. I mean, mm. what, the, what is actually very intelligent done with the Inflation Reduction Act in America is that they're only giving cash to the ones that are successful in delivering the end results, whether it's hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, wh whether it's battery delivered or uh, solar power delivered. So I think, and I think that's a good model because uh, the, the US state doesn't take much technology risk. Companies have to take that te technology risk. So maybe you can do something, you know, with, uh, let's say, carbon-free aviation. Okay, we give you $10 for every passenger kilometer of carbon-free. Exactly. And you can do the, and, and the companies then, because the, the market will then work very well. And it could do that maybe from the explicit kind of pile of money or whatever you call it, with, from the CO2 taxes, for example. So I think, uh, I think uh, many good things are done already, but uh, I think even more creativity and kind of uh, could, could be applied uh, to make the right incentives uh, to make this fly. <laughs> um, same with, with trucking, etc. You know, I think we will see a revolution in ele electric trucking very soon, but it should be a target, you know, for every truck mile, uh, you should have this and this amount, etc. Louise? I, I don't disagree at all. I think the, the, the interesting thing is, you know, in, some of the, in the example I just gave, in the UK, the government there has chosen to run competitions. So they, they might be described as subsidies, but they are actually incentives to put your own money down, private investment down, in order to build something uh, that, and, and make sure you can secure the customers and build the system. So it doesn't quite work in the same way as the IRA because they've, they've taken a slightly different approach to how they've modelled the activity, but essentially that it is a competition to incentivize private investment. And that's going to be, it's going to be an essential way of doing it because there isn't enough public money in any case to do all of these things. Whether you think it's expensive or not, there simply isn't enough public funding to, to, to go around. And, and, and many others will advocate to say that it's actually 80% of the funding for the transition will come from the private sector. So incentivizing uh, the, the building of these systems and, and drawing the customers in and doing what business is good at doing to make that work is, is the ideal way around to, to structure. Uh, the, the, it's certainly the early adoption of making some of the moves we need to before we can scale. But is it only the big companies, Andreas, that can actually do the investments needed for that kind of transition? That's a good question. Um, in, in one way, I, I'd say yes, because it depends, again, on what part of the supply chain you're looking at. And uh, I mean, if you look at aviation on the manufacturing side, it's, it's a small club uh, with a few countries around the world, which is really part of that club, and it's very difficult to get in. However, with new technology now, it's a, a lot of new entrants, and may, perhaps it's easier for people to, or people and businesses around the world to, to join in. Um, on the operator side, I'd say, uh, well, one of the challenges with a, a, a transition is, is the heavy investments in the beginning to, 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 uh, to start with, um, with new technology, because a lot of infrastructure structure needs to be in place and all the, those things. Um, but I'm very much in favor of what you said, that we need to have support schemes which uh, combines the power of businesses trying to find a good and viable business case and where they get some support in doing that through a support scheme instead of uh, just giving a lump sum of, of, um, of um, support from any, any scheme. It, it's something about combining the power of, of the businesses and, and uh, more or less the support schemes help them making the business case more viable sooner. Um, that's what we have to do because we, we don't want to have a situation where, where you where you don't need to look for the, what, for the viable business. We, we, we need business to do that. From your introduction, uh, Sigrun, it, it, we could hear that you thought the uh, industry were the ones, because they have a very profitable business, who are the ones who should pay for this. Well, particularly in oil and gas and offshore wind, yes. But the CO2 tax is paid by business. The CO2 tax is a wonderful thing. It's predictable, it's going to increase, it's, it's making it very clear that the cost of carbon is increasing. The revenue of the CO2 tax ideally is going down because when we cut emissions, there's not going to be any revenue anymore. So it would be very, uh, a very bad idea to spend that money and to lock that money into pensions and, and kindergartens and schools and health projects because it's going to disappear. Now, uh, knowing that and also that 
the revenue from just the CO2 tax, and we have other, fortunately, other environmental taxes too, just the revenue from that is many times bigger than what we actually need to get to 55% to in 2030. And I agree we need to link those two. Um, I'm not so sure if it's a technical problem as much as it is a political one. Politicians are somehow reluctant to spend money on climate issues. Would it help them to have funds channeled into some sort of CO2 fund and just take it from there? I'm not so sure, but I think we need to shift the debate from the climate uh, job being very expensive and, and heavy in subsidies to actually being a net revenue for the government. And how can you spend that money wisely uh, to make sure that when you get to 2030 and then to 2050, you've actually made the investments necessary from that money that you generated. Uh, and that's more of a communications and a political issue than really it's a technical one. Um, and then I just wanted to add on what Andreas was saying on the power of procurement, because we're already spending money on aviation in Norway. We're buying uh, unprofitable aviation uh, trajectories in the, uh, in the west and the north, and we need to use that money to push for more environmentally and zero emission solutions. Same thing with supply ships, with helicopters, with any sort of transport that the government is buying. The electrification of ferries has been a huge success in Norway, uh, where we've actually, through public procurement, have both pushed technology and cut emissions. In terms of results-based climate funding, yes, uh, and that's what carbon contracts for difference are about, for example. That's what auctions or negative CO2 tax is about. It's about actually paying for emissions reduction. And I think that's where we need to do more. Hmm. We are uh, coming to a uh, close of a very exciting conversation, but I, I wanted to uh, challenge all of you, actually, starting with, with Jaren. Um, at Arnold Suka last week, uh, last week, last year, you were <laughs> quite optimistic no. about the speed of the global energy transition provided we have strong political support. Um, are you still optimistic that we will reach the 1.6 degree goal? Yes, because uh, what has happened since then is that uh, solar is going even faster. And as I said, people haven't really digested that solar is going to be a disrupted technology, basically being so cheap that it will change everything in the energy market in combination with batteries. So that is actually going faster Wind is going as expected, batteries are going faster. The policy is a lot of apparent headwind and the green shares has crashed. But that doesn't mean that it's, it's irrelevant, like uh, as little as the dot-com crash in 2002 meant that internet was irrelevant. Now you just need to find the right business models. So, um, and what we see now is a lot of focus on met uh, methane uh, reductions with new technologies that we didn't have even five years ago to, to track where the methane reductions are and, and how to stop them. And we see all the oil and gas companies now starting to really focus on that. And that's a very uh, short uh, time. Uh, you, you can gain a lot in a short time from that. So no reasons to be more pessimistic, rather the opposite uh, for the last six months. How about the rest of you? Are you uh, as optimistic? I'm optimistic, absolutely. I don't think I would have, have joined the, in, into the role from where I've been if I wasn't, if I didn't think it was a real opportunity. Um, but I do think that the, your, your question is part loaded because the political will is the piece that's really important. That alongside, I think, and that's about decision making, that's about some bravery in the decision making, whether you know, it, particularly if it might be deemed to be unpopular for whatever reason, um, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, and that's, you know, that's firmly where, where we sit. And I think the other challenge for us in building these systems is the regulatory environments that we've got. We don't have the playbooks for some of this as we sit here now. And we need to, we need to get on and do that so that we can operate these, these, these businesses at scale as quickly as possible. Hmm. Do we see the political will, Sigrun? Um, I would say no, but uh, there, is, there are things, there have been some things happening this week, so I'm trying to cling to that. I always feel better after listening to Yaran, so that's great. <laughs> and then um, this week, uh, the government announced 200 million for CCS projects. They were going to spend 1.5 billion on cutting emissions in heavy industry. So things are happening, uh, but I wouldn't say optimistic in the sense that this is going to solve itself. Uh, more uh, uh, impatient in the sense that it's not that hard, but... Um, we have to keep pushing. Yeah. It's not that hard on this. 
Yeah, not to forget that one billion for aviation, green aviation, yes. from government as well. Um, yeah, look, I mean, uh, on behalf of the aviation industry, when, when I started working on this kind of next-gen aircraft, new technology, five years ago, it was a small sport. It was something we talked about here in the Nordics. Uh, now it's a World Cup. Uh, everybody's talking about it, from here to the US and also in Asia. Um, attended a panel in Brussels uh, some weeks ago, 120 delegates talking about zero emission technologies. It's really coming because now the customers ask for this and the operators have to do something and the, the, the snowball has started rolling. So it's happening, it's getting momentum. It is happening. Thank you all so much for your wonderful conversation. Very interesting. And uh, well, thank you all of you. I, I am sure we could uh, continue this conversation for a long time. Uh, we will now take a 15-minute break, and we'll be back here with part two, then diving into offshore wind. And please, there is coffee and some refreshments outside.
mycket snack om subsidier men ja. vad tror du det vi snackar Problem. Ja, det er ikke så lett. Det lå kært.
Welcome back for part two of our seminar today. And for this session, we will focus on the prospects of offshore wind in Norway from 2025 and beyond. And for any uh, here who had not received the message, the ongoing auction is actually over and there is a press conference at 10.45. So we will, of course, announce the news. Uh, sure quite a few want to look at their phones but it will be great if concentrate on our great uh, presenters so um, I will actually finally happening here in Norway despite delays political disagreements rising costs and uncertainties whether it would actually be in a bidders to uh, start this session we have Patrick Edwardson. He is head of offshore wind in the Nordics for BP. True Scandinavian with a Swedish mother, Norwe uh, Norwegian father, and he's married a Dane. <laughs> he's been working for more than 13 years in the renewable industry, starting at Ørsted and now at BP as a strong contender in the future of offshore wind. Please welcome to the stage Patrick Edwardson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, for having us, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a nice cat. Yeah. <laughs> I had one ex looking exactly like that uh, as a child. It was, brings back warm memories. Anyway, uh, I'm Patrick, head of offshore wind for the Nordics for BP. I joined actually half a year ago, but I've been in the renewable industry for, uh, for more than 13 years. It's really fantastic to be in Oslo again. Um, I've grown, basically grown up in Wittstein, um, where my family have a, have a cabin. We spent every single summer in that small red cabin as children, either staring at the water, which I find is something you do a lot in Norway, <laughs> or on the water or in the water. Now I bring my kids there. I think ever since I started in renewables, it's been a dream to help facilitate offshore wind into Norway. Not just one wind farm, but at scale. Take a trip from the cabin, bring my family there and show them a marvelous example of security of supply of green electrons. I know solar is really kicking off, but Northwestern Europe really needs offshore wind to decarbonize. It's, it's clear, otherwise we need some pretty big batteries. How do we make this scalable? How do we continue? How do we make it into an industry? I think there was a lot of talk about subsidies. How do we make an industry stand on its own feet in Norway? We've been through subsidies in Denmark, in Netherlands, still on that in the UK for slightly different reasons. That's a different, very different structure. But now we've moved into concession fees. So basically negative subsidies happening across Europe. And Germany last year is a prime example of that. Even in an industry in a basically perfect storm. Managed to pull off, yes, that's, there will be hurdles, the industry will cost out again, it, it will get done. But how do we make this happen for Norway as well? We're not yet there. It's fantastic news that the auction is now closed. Really, really good that we see the industry starting. The fundamental issue in Norway is our willingness to pay for power and the current power prices. So looking ahead 10 years, starting today, averaging the price for 10 years, Norwegian prices are 25% lower than Danish power prices. They are 35 to 40% lower than German and Dutch power prices, and somewhere in between for UK power prices. Add to that these sites we've chosen to build out. First, here they are SN2, 200 kilometers from shore, the Danish equivalent being auctioned off in December, is 15 to 30 kilometers from shore. It's Denmark 15 to 30 meter water depth. We have SN2 of 60 meters. So we've, we've essentially chosen sites that are prime real estate for wind speed. It's magnificent wind speed. It's a fantastic resource, very stable and high wind speeds, but very difficult and costly to build. How do we make that equation work in, especially if we go into a non-subsidized regime? Well, personally, the reason I joined BP really is because I think the future of offshore wind is about 
maximizing the value deliberately of every single electron being produced out of that offshore wind farm. Making sure we sell it to the grid domestically when that makes sense, storing it, selling it to a high-speed charger, which Luis talked about, turning it into molecules. It's about ensuring we have access and can tap into the different value pools where there are willingness to pay above the pretty low Norwegian power prices. And I know saying that in a Norwegian room, we think power prices are pretty high, but looking across Europe, it's actually the lowest. Northern Sweden beats us, but it's, we're pretty well off on the power price in general. How do we make it work? I mean, it's about integration. It's about making sure we get hybrids. So the in initial inception of offshore wind in Norway was to create hybrid projects. SN2 was located quite far from the Norwegian shore, but actually quite close or equally far from other coasts. So a good example of a power integration project, allowing us to shift power between countries when that makes most sense. The other benefit in, in Norway is actually the low power prices, the stability of them, and the very green grid, which then can be used to produce green hydrogen, which will kick in. It's, it's not a matter of will it, it's a matter of when and who takes the first step. And that's, again, to Luis's and, and the previous panelist points, it's the lockstep, right? Who takes the first bet? In Denmark, for example, right now, we're debating uh, all the politicians around who puts the first security on the hydrogen pipelines to Germany. It's 200 kilometers pipeline that can turn Denmark into an energy exporting nation. Okay, they have been looking to Norway and said, what, what did Norway do when they established themselves as a energy exporting superpower for Northwestern Europe? It was really investments and willingness to invest to create an industry which then has been a significant benefit. How do we make that work? Government needs commitments, industry needs commitments. Who takes the first step? Who dares to make the first brave decision? And then it's, dominoes is a bad example, but it's really what will happen. It will just kickstart everything. I think for me, it's really important that Norway taps into this existing system that we know so well that has brought a lot of wealth to Norway as energy exporters. It's not just about retaining the electrons in Norway, it's about making the most of them, finding a structure where the Norwegian consumer and, and Norwegian citizens benefit from it, but also that we can replace a lot of the current molecules coming out of Norway with something else without necessarily jeopardizing the average household's ability to pay for their power bill. And there are quite clear indications that this can happen. Um, and also, take it on the other end, with the amount of offshore wind Norway is looking at, and with the growing power demands, as other sources start to dwindle and disappear, we also need the offshore wind farms to come in. But it's not certain that all offshore wind farms will be economic in the future unless we think much more broadly, think about integration of electrons and molecules and cross-border electrons. That's, for me, the fundamental challenge Norway sits on. Really, really good real estate to capture the high wind speeds and quite stable wind speeds. Very solid experience as an energy exporting nation. I think my push here is to say, how can we make this come together, just like we did in the 70s for, for the oil and gas industry? There's such a big opportunity. Offshore wind in Norway can become a marvelous growth story, or we can risk it becoming these niche projects still requiring state support to get built. Right? The Norwegian supply industry for offshore wind is already world-class and world-leading, so we, we know how to build it. Right? Now it's a matter of scaling that up and making sure we get a domestic foothold as well. Right? That's it for me for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick.
Not sure if anybody's going to get a seat here afterwards. The, the cat has taken the place. Um, next up is uh, Christian Rinning Tennyson. Um, Stadkraft is Europe's largest producer of renewable energy production and the second highest valued company in Norway. Five months ago, after 14 years of, as president and CEO of Stadkraft, Christian Rinning Tennyson announced he wanted to step down. And he said, I remain fully committed to my role as CEO and will continue with full force until the day I hand over the reins to my successor. And he truly has. Uh, only Monday his successor was announced and she will enter into position on April 1st. Uh, Mr. Kristen Rinning Tennyson will be sharing his thoughts on the technology development for the offshore wind industry and what financial instruments is needed to use, utilize its potential. We are very grateful and proud that you are here today, still with full force. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, I, I am still the CEO and I can assure you I will still be interested in energy and offshore and Norway and Europe after my period as CEO in Stadkraft. We are here to talk about Norwegian offshore wind. Uh, let me just uh, uh, start to uh, explain what Stadkraft has been um, doing over the last years. So, um, uh, we were in the UK in four projects uh, that were developed from 2009 to until 2017, hugely successful on one of the early developers. We all sold out uh, in 2017. We did not have the financial capacity at the time to fulfill all our strategies. So we sacrificed the offshore wind, if you like, to move full speed on onshore wind and solar and hydro. So today we have more than 400 projects in those technologies under development in Europe and elsewhere. But we are now back in offshore wind. Um, we have an ongoing uh, development in, in Ireland just outside Dublin and uh, several other projects in, in Ireland together with Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners. And we have uh, several prospects in Sweden that we are developing, plus uh, Utsira Nord, where we are together with uh, uh, Aker also and uh, Ocean Winds to place a bid there. Um, we do not expect to win the auction today <laughs> since we didn't place a bid. Uh, <laughs> we, we couldn't find it uh, uh, fulfilling our financial criteria there, but we are very much supporting the winner, whoever it may be. We do want the offshore win in Norway to start. These are the targets by countries. They were shown by Jaran earlier today, so they are the same. They add up almost to the EU target of 300 gigawatts by 2050. If that target is reached, it will pr produce an amount of electricity roughly equal, equal to 20% of all electricity consumption in Europe. So this is massive. It's going to be a, a major part of uh, the whole electricity supply. Uh, to Europe, um, but but how do we how do we what concept should we Norway do in order to uh, be a part of this in the best way possible? Uh, the costs of offshore wind today, on bottom fixed are these are European average numbers. So the, all projects vary a lot, of course. But solar, the the dark blue, are now. Solar and onshore wind are the lowest costs of new electricity in Europe and more or less everywhere on the planet. Floating offshore wind is still quite expensive, but very early days. And then we have coal and gas, which uh, is uh, uh, expected to, uh, to become more expensive over time because of CO2 charges put on top. It's very difficult to predict what the CO2 cost will be in 2050, but uh, to, to get these technologies uh, um, down, there needs to be higher CO2 costs in the future. But we believe that offshore wind floating will come down to roughly the same level as floating, uh, floating the same level as bottom fixed, 
because the, the windmill itself is the same, it's the structure, is it, is it piled to the ground or is it floating that differs? And floating offshore wind can be produced at the yards onshore and taken out, uh, anchored and, and put together in, in a much more effective way than when you have to do it with ships out uh, um, uh, in monopiles or other structures out in, in deep seas. So we are very optimistic uh, on this, but it needs to go in several technology steps. So the basic strategy for any country is to make sure that we have an iteration of projects, one following the other, to get costs down, 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 uh, over, over several technology generations. It, is, it should not be uh, a huge development on floating offshore wind until technology costs have come down. It should be a sequence of projects coming after each other. Uh, we also believe that offshore wind will be quite competitive in the same way um, and that costs will come down from where it is now, which is kind of, it has come down for many years, it went up for the last two years. It is of a kind of a peak now and we expect it slowly to go down. The one technology that will go down the steepest and it's not, this is, it's not fully reflected here in, in a way, it's is solar. Uh, that is already now, uh, has started to come down steeply after the cost increase that we all observed uh, over, over the last few years. Um, so these uh, technologies here in the yellow square are going to be the technologies in the world that will produce most electricity in the future. Hydropower will still be important, especially for balancing out the systems, uh, but far uh, less growth than these technologies here. So what, how should uh, Norway um, set up the next projects? It should be uh, hybrid projects, uh, bottom fixed uh, or floating, uh, with a large uh, capacity, exactly the double of the cables in the middle typical industrial standard of a, a, a K DC cable today is 1500 megawatts. It may become 1600 or 1700 in the future. And in that case, the wind park should be 3200 or 3400. So to exactly match two cables out. And with this design, uh, the, the, when it blows half, half of the 3000, uh, the 1500 produced will go to the market paying the best. So it will be more profitable because you always sell the first part of the electricity to the best paying market. And Norway has a strategy uh, uh, by the government, but also supported by many political uh, parties, to have the lowest electricity prices in total Europe. So why should we develop an industry only selling to the lowest paying market? This uh, will allow half of the, elect or the first half to be sold to another market. UK is excellent, could be Germany, Netherlands, Belgium. It, one can even have a triple cable out, but uh, in that case uh, it, it, it has other disadvantages. This is technically much more easy, even if it's complicated enough as, as that is. So one advantage is, from an economical point of view, the first part of what is produced is sold to the best paying market. The second is, when there is no win or little win, this will work as a transmission cable. So if there's no win, 1500 megawatt will go from the market with the lowest price, though with a, yeah, with a, uh, lowest price to the highest price. So if the price is the highest in the UK, it will go to the UK. But it will not always be UK having uh, the highest price. That will vary depending on weather patterns and, and wind conditions and solar conditions in Southern Europe and in the UK and what have you. So uh, in some of the time, it will also go to Norway. When it blows more than 1500 megawatt, this design forces the remaining production above 1500 to go to the other market, the, the, in, to Norway, if Norway has the lowest price. And at full speed, it goes 1500 uh, megawatts to both, independent of the price in each end. It's, it's by design. So, uh, when calculating this, the amount of electricity that is forced to Norway uh, in any price scenario, because it's all the electricity produced when more than 1500 megawatt is, is produced, is such a big amount of electricity 
that it is more than you are able to export out even if prices was always higher in the UK than in Norway because there are so good wind conditions out that the production in the middle is so big. So this is a design that is the most economical while at the same time guaranteeing uh, net flow to Norway. Of course, at the same time, it also guarantees net flow to the UK. Um, and, and over the many decades to come, it's not easy to say which country gets the most. In the beginning, it's likely to be the UK. In the long run, nobody knows. But by this design, it goes net to both countries in all scenarios. And therefore, it will lower the price in both countries, also in the UK. So this is the best design. It is it, it, the next design in 2025 on bottom fixed should be this design. Utsira Nord is too far north, so it's not really a suitable site as as this. I mean, so I, I wouldn't say. I, I think that auction should go as planned, but but also for the future, this could be done with floating as well as fixed. There, there's no. It will be more expensive with the floating, but the principle is the same. It will be the most economical given the technology. So, um, uh, when it comes to floating, it's Utsira Nur here uh, that um, is about to be uh, to be auction, auctioned out. Uh, uh, Norwegian authorities have ongoing discussion with the EU on the regulatory aspect there. Uh, but here it's uh, announced th there should be three concessions to three co uh, consortiums, which will develop each part, which is also probably a, a good design because then areas are allocated to companies before they make the investment decision or before they have to make that decision in, in uh, SN2. Um, you don't have to make a decision yet, but if you, do, if you get uh, the winner that is announced today, if that winner is not um, making an investment decision, you have to pay a fine of 2 billion Norwegian kroner because you never took the investment decision. Here it is not, uh, it's based on differently, each consortium develops the best and um, there will be like a second auction on, on the construction itself. This is more like the oil and gas system where you get allocated area first. You, you put your engineers in, you, you develop the oil or gas field as good as you can, and then you apply for allowance to construct. You, un, you, you have to spend money on, on, on technology and, and, and drilling, etc., but you never get the fine for not uh, investing in a certain oil field. So I like much more the two-stage approach, where you first, first allocate area to uh, competent consortiums, and secondly, uh, have them competing on um, uh, get the loans to construct. Uh, at the moment, it's Hive in Tampen is in fact uh, the biggest floating offshore uh, project in Europe. So uh, this is in very early days of an infant industry. Uh, which is going to be extremely interesting in the future. So, um, that's it. Statkraft intends to be uh, an important company in all the major renewable technologies. We are capital restricted now. We have more than 400 projects under development, as I just mentioned, as, uh, plus uh, onshore and plus a few offshore. So we have to be strict in, in, in which projects to uh, develop, but we have a so-called develop and sell model. So we are building much more projects than we can finance and selling it on into the financial market. So the uh, uh, the impact Statkraft is making for the for the world and and to reduce climate actions is the sum <laughs> of what we construct and keep and what we construct and sell. They will all produce renewable energy to all, to ourselves or to different owners in the future. Thank you. Look forward to the debate. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we are still waiting for <laughs> who will actually be the winner of, of the auction. Uh, so I'm, I'm debating uh, with myself whether we should 
do a couple of minutes before. It's not fair to board. Uh, to be standing up here presenting uh, if everybody <laughs> is looking for the auction. Um, it has not yet been announced. Are you ready to get going? Uh, our last presenter, he is Deputy CEO of Renewables Norway, representing about 400 companies involved in the production, distribution and trading of electricity in Norway. Please, Bård Standal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Ambassador and the cat. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm, what should I say? I am somewhat of a time optimist. So when I wrote, uh, wrote down a few notes for, uh, for myself for, the, uh, for this meeting, I wrote, do some reflections on how, how the auction went. <laughs> uh, I, I think maybe I'll wait with that for a couple of minutes, but it, it might come back at the end. Uh, but, but I think that what we now know is that the, or, uh, the auction had a result that we can build on. Uh, and uh, in my organization, as I said, I'm the deputy CEO of Renewables Norway. We represent basically everyone who produces energy in Norway, everybody who sells it, and also the grid companies. I especially focus on, on market and grid questions. And, and what, what I would say from, from us is that, uh, well, for offshore wind in general, what we need, and I think I say this in every panel that I'm with, with the politicians these days, not only on offshore wind, we need predictability. We, we need to keep the momentum going on the transition that we have, because that is the transition that we have. The, mo the most important risk that, uh, that we see going forward is really people constantly coming up with a better idea. Because it's, it's not so that we haven't worked with these things for de decades. It's so that we are in the middle now of the phase where we're going uh, from talking about what we're doing to actually doing it. Uh, uh, so, so predictability is the most important thing for our members and for the industry so that we have a planning horizon. And when we have that planning horizon in, uh, in place, uh, we strongly believe that offshore wind can become a big, big industry for Norway. N uh, not only in, uh, in exporting, or we should, we should come back to what, what names we use, uh, use for the grid, uh, electrons, but for the entire supplier industry that we have in Norway, that we have built on uh, for quite some time. We, we believe that we can be in the forefront of doing this, uh, which is not only a green transition, but it's a technology transition. It is a technology transition that needs to build on the knowledge that we have and what we have done on oil and gas for, for quite, quite some decades when it comes to technology and comes to, uh, 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 comes to Kind of taking the resources that we have. And in Norway, uh, very much of this will be on the floating side, which is maybe the most technology intensive side of this that we have. Theoretically, when we look back 30, 40 years from now, we could be in a situation where, uh, where floating offshore is actually cheaper than bottom fixed, because uh, people come up with technological solutions to do things quite differently. But then we need predictability. And that means that what happens tomorrow, or later today, now that the, the auction is, uh, is here, uh, is actually quite, quite important. Because what happens the day after tomorrow depends on what we do today. Uh, and we, uh, I would say three things from our, our side when it comes to what we do today. Number one is the next phase. Well, uh, now we're eagerly awaiting what, uh, what the government does with Utsira uh, Noor and uh, the discussions they have with ESA. We think that the model that we are working with in Norway, with a two-stage model, with a maturation period, is something that can actually work. But it's different from what our colleagues in the European Union have been, uh, been used to working in. So we, uh, we do a lot of work in Brussels, we do a lot of work with our, with our partners in the European Union to make them understand that this model actually uh, can work going forward. Which is important for a country with more than 70% all the potential areas that we have for offshore wind are suitable for floating. Second, and this is the predictability and momentum, we, we now need to move quickly towards the next call in 2025. <coughs> we need to preserve the ground, uh, preserve the, uh, prepare the ground for successful and pre uh, predictive calls going forward. The industry needs to know what is coming and be able to plan for that. 
and we are already at the end of Q1 2024. So uh, we want government in Norway to, uh, to come with more uh, information and ensure predictability on the 2025 run. Third, uh, and I, I think you had a very good slide on it, we need to make sure that the grid that we develop in the North Sea uh, is suitable for actually doing this development on, uh, at a large scale. This means that we need to have hybrid solutions, we need to, to look at the whole North Sea grid, not, not only towards the UK, but towards the uh, Netherlands, towards Germany, back to Norway. We need to look at this as one, uh, one combined uh, connected grid. Uh, that is the way that we, uh, that we can get the most out of these resources. So these are the three things for the day tomorrow. Do we have a verdict yet? We do. We do. Yeah. And the winner is? It's Venture. It's uh, Inca and Parkwind. Cool. Give <laughs> 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 well, us. Thank you, board. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that that was the applause was for the, for the winner <laughs> or if it was for you, but well, offshore wind is is on the move in Norway, and we're getting started. Um, thank you all to our three presenters uh, for uh, for your insights. Um, we have we had invited um, Marianne Sivisnes, who is chair of the uh, Energy Committee. Unfortunately, she uh, had to uh, call in sick last night. Uh, Nikolai Astrup, he has uh, business in Parliament and his duties there. But as he himself explained it to be, he called it a, a train for bus solution. So we have Tina Bru uh, <laughs> instead. Uh, so who <laughs> she is the former minister of then petroleum and energy. And he, she is the deputy leader of the Conservative Party. So we would like to invite both Tina and uh, all of you who uh, presented back on stage, if Kat will allow, though. So, Norway has high ambitions for developing offshore wind. Uh, the government aims to allocate areas for 30,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2040, equivalent to nearly the same power of production as Norway's hydro system today. Uh, and in April of last year, the uh, Norwegian Water Resources and Energy Directorate uh, presented 20 new potential areas for offshore wind production. And as we've heard, there could be three uh, new next year. And thank you all so much for coming to the panel. And of course, Tina, now that the auction is over, government is saying this is a success. You were not a fan of the framework for this auction. Um, what do you think now? Well, I think um, today is a day for celebrations no matter what uh, i have thought about this <laughs> model and the framework before because it does clearly mark the beginning of what can be a big big uh, adventure for norway we are we are bracing a new frontier we are really finally getting offshore wind uh, running in norway so today we celebrate no matter what um, but of course, I think that we could have had uh, even bigger ambitions on this. I think if we had, from the get-go, had a framework that allowed for hybrid cables, that allowed for a different type of development of the area, that would have allowed for a, a bigger production in the area than what we get now because of only the radial and not the, the hybrid cable, we might have been somewhere else uh, today. But uh, I think it's important for me to say, because I know there are, of course, industry actors here today as well, that uh, no matter what happens in the next election, if we were to regain power again, we are not going to cancel any contracts or move back on this. Our policy is not reversing, in contrary to today's government. Uh, so today... <laughs> not just, here to de defend themselves, That, that is not my fault. <laughs> 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 um, it will not be like Sogne Commune. No, it will not be like Sogne Commune. That is, uh, that is right. <laughs> Uh, but yes, now I think uh, we celebrate today and we look forward to uh, everything that is uh, hopefully still going
going to be happening on, on the floating uh, projects on Utsira. And for me, it uh, also um, feels like a kind of personal victory because a lot of the start of this happened when we were in government and it was in the white paper that we, we announced. So uh, I'm pleased today and I wish uh, the winners uh, all of luck with producing and, and building this project. Yeah, and of course, the focus of this conversation is to look at 2025 and beyond for offshore wind. Of course, we're all happy that you know, we're finally getting started. And, and looking at the future, uh, Christian, um, what do you think it would be important now, uh, looking at 2025? Uh, I, I can simplify it to two things. One I already mentioned in my introduction, it is to have the, hy the hybrid, the one that is connected two ways with the double of the capacity in the middle as a main concept. In addition to some radials that will have to be needed further north. Uh, but in the south. So, so that concept, I think, is, is number one. It gives three revenue streams. It gives the, the electricity production itself, same as a radial. But then it gives the um, transit of electricity when it's not blowing revenue stream, the congestion revenues, as it is called. Plus, it gives also a connection from to Norway and the other countries so we can sell ancillary services to, to in short, the time intervals... Um, uh, use the cable as, as a way of stabilizing the grid in the UK by uh, having a hydropower backing in Norway. So the, 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 all these are major uh, money streams uh, paying for the same cost, so to say. The cost of uh, having a hybrid, the, the, the park itself is the same, but, uh, uh, but the revenue streams are, are threefold and, and it's just one a half cable, so to say, in addition cost-wise. Mm -hmm. Uh, plus, you get the double capacity, of course, for half a cable or for one more cable. So when you do the math, it's this hybrid concept is is number one. But there's another one uh, which is also very important. That is the predictability for the supply industry, and that needs to be a bit uh, between the main political parties and an alignment uh, to say that we, we, there, there will be. Uh, auctions on a regular basis, like it has been in the oil and gas industry, because we want the big suppliers of wind turbines, more cable uh, factories, more supply industry of all kinds to establish themselves in Norway, and they need to be believe in, in the predictability of, of more uh, projects coming, uh, more auctions one year after the other. You don't build a huge factory for two projects, so 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 that is also important. Yeah, you also talked about predictability, board, and that was mm. your your uh, your main point to politicians going mm. forward. Um, it, it, do you do you fear that there will not be? Well, uh, uh, I, I think that we have to uh, kind of separate the signal from the noise. There's a lot of noise in the public debate. That is not necessarily going to translate, uh, translate into policies, uh, regardless of who wins the elections or not. <laughs> but, but I think that the debate in Norway is difficult when it comes to offshore wind and, and the role that the state should take. Uh, and at the same time, keeping that debate in such, uh, going in such a way that you, you don't get that predictability will actually drive up costs. Right? What, what you need uh, to get the costs down is to make sure that we're on the bottom fix that is a more mature technology, that we have large enough uh, rounds so that uh, people can go down that cost scale. And on uh, floating, which uh, is going down a, uh, a development path, we need to have predictability. I, I would say I would really like it to be yearly auctions so that uh, you, you could plan and you could test new technology going forward for a technology game that will, will last for, uh, for several years. Hmm. Patrick, you touched upon the importance of integration uh, in, in your speech. How do we ensure success in that matter? I think one, one solution is to definitely look at the, the hybrid cables that Christian also talked about. And whether it's three in the middle and 1.5, 1.5 or even bigger, I think you, if you go bigger to UK, uh, we'll have the political challenge. So I think your solution there solves a lot of issues. But we also have a lot of hours then where we say let's produ we produce 54% of power. So we get 4% of the power sent to Norway in a, in a basically underutilized cable. So th there's something we can build on there as not just a 3 gigawatt site, but a, the broader build-out potential with, with an even bigger grid. It's something we, we definitely for sure should look at. 
to how do we maximize across the North Sea. Um, secondly, it's around the value streams and value pools. It's difficult to sh ship hydrogen. We need to produce it in markets where we have predictability and of green electrons, because otherwise it will not be compliant with the RFMBO standards. Norway is a really good candidate for that, but how do we get it out of the market and labeled as green? Um, could be with ESAF, which is much easier to transport, or ammonia. There's already projects going on, and the low power prices will benefit from that. But again, it's around how do we get predictability on what is going to come. So not only we need predictability on how the auction format is going, going to look mm -hmm. and what the criteria will be, so what is the customer looking for that we need to solve, because if that continues to shift, the project design continues to shift and cost will go up, as was also mentioned. But it's making sure we get the regulation in place in kind of collaboration with the industry. Uh, but who makes the first bold move? Is that one player acting on behalf of the, the industry or is it a state agency putting its foot down saying that now we enable this you know, integration of electrons and molecules? Hmm. Tina? When it comes to predictability, I think we can first be happy that despite a main difference on whether we should have hybrid cables or not, which has been a big political discussion, there is a lot of um, political consensus on some of the very other important framework conditions. Uh, for example, just the fact that the new government actually continued the path that we put down in our white paper on what kind of auction, that you should have the auction forum on, on Sörlien uh, and that you should have a more developmental technology kind of path on Utsira is a good thing. It shows that there is political consensus on those two main important uh, pillars of the framework. But I think moving forward, what we uh, are going to need is we need to also, like is being said here, find predictability on other key pillars. Like, for example, are we going to be a part of developing the grid in the Northern Sea? Do we want a seat at that table? Do we want to join ourselves and, and hitch our wagon to all the processes that are happening in the EU? I think we, we need that. Uh, that is the only way moving forward. But unfortunately, the political landscape right now and, and the backdrop that you have for this discussion in Norway, not just between politicians, but in the public in general, is we are coming out or are still in a situation where electricity prices have been very, very high. This has been a very potent, very conflict-driven discussion in Norway. And I think selling hybrids in that picture is still an upwards climb. It's not going to be easy. So, and right now we are mostly talking about offshore wind in Norway as a way to just produce more power to our own use and to keep prices down. And yes, that is a part of it, but the, in that sense, you lose the whole industry perspective. You lose the whole perspective on why we're doing this, which is more than just producing power. It's about finding new kinds of businesses, new industries, new supply chains that fit with what we are already good at in Norway. So we need to like come back to that path, I think, if we are going to get public acceptance for the need to, for example, build, build hybrids. And I think we have to find political consensus on solutions that make that feasible. Like, for example, can you imagine having, like NVE also has said, a larger cable to Norway to make sure that more of the power goes to us than to just have this even split. I'm not saying that is the solution, but it's one of the things that might help ease in the conversation. We need to show the Norwegian people what's in it for them. Uh, and we can't stick our, hand, our heads in the sand and think that this is not going to be conflict-driven, because it is. And the sooner we realize that, the bigger chances we have of actually landing political consensus, but also public consensus that this is a good thing. Right now, public opinion is for offshore wind. We have to keep it that way if we are going to succeed. Yeah, but I mean, as you said, the discussion on, on cables, pretty much everybody in this room is probably for yeah. uh, hybrid cables, but then you have the debate, that is what is right doing, uh, having prices go up. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we mitigate that in the, in the debate? Well, I think one of the important things that, if you draw a parallel to when we started with uh, wind onshore in, in Norway, everyone was for it. They thought it was very good. Uh, let's build more of it. Let's ha have it happen faster. And I think part of that was because you, you had the link between building that onshore wind power farm and building a new industry. So people saw that you get workplaces out of this, it's uh, more welfare to us, we are, it's earning us money. And we all know that the truth with hybrid cables on offshore wind also is a way to earn money for us and it's good for us, but I think that link is kind of missing. So you need to maybe talk more about the industrial opportunities, more about how this is gonna benefit regular people through jobs, through 
growth in societies, through local impact, et cetera. Uh, it's not easy, but I think that is one of the, the ways to do it. Hmm. Christian, do people see hybrid cables as just something that you can make more money of? Uh, <laughs> the, 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 I, I fully agree with um, Tina here that uh, uh, the, to get the political acceptance in Norway for hybrid cables uh, is very important and not easy. So, and for that reason, I advocate this two-cable solution. From a technical, economical point of view, probably a three-cable solution with one to the UK, one to the continent, and one to Norway is the best and it also gives the best flow and the most optimal solution from a technical point of view. But uh, in that case, you could not guarantee net energy flow to Norway, because there will be scenarios where with the, if there are highest uh, prices in the two other countries, it will not. So, so for that reason, it's better to advocate, what should I say, the second best and close to the best solution that combines this uh, two market solution with the net flow to both countries. It, it's the best realistic political solution in my head. And, and then later on in, 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 in decades to come, it may evolve into something e even more integrated. So that's one aspect. Two others is what we uh, discussed before the break here is the financing of all this. Uh, also, offshore wind is a new infrastructure. It needs to be financed. Um, and uh, now the government is, uh, for this first auction, putting 23 billion knock on the table, and it is over the state budget. So this, this is not sustainable. If the next, if the, if the floating is going to need a lot more per megawatt than bottom fixed, etc., cetera, um, it has to be a, a different financial model. How is, how it, it is all a big part of the energy transition. It will create a new industry that will be hugely profitable in the future, but it needs public support. We, can, uh, we should not call it subsidies, but um, it, it is public money. So, so okay, so, so to, without having exactly the form of it, there needs, in my head, to be a separate kind of budget or a separate pot of money where money is getting in from CO2 charges and other sources and out so it's, it's kept outside the state budget. And my final point is we should uh, consider fisheries enough so that we don't enter into the same situation as the reindeer herders in Fosen. We, we underestimated it in Startcraft. Uh, Fair to say, we, we did spend a lot of time considering it and thought it was well done, but obviously the High Court in Norway uh, ruled it was not, and we should not end in the same situation with the fisheries. This can be a good thing for fisheries, because if you have a wind farm, you are not allowed to fish in between there, so it could be like a breeding area for fish. Uh, but, but it has to be done in a good way. Mm. Patrick and then board. Um, I, I fully agree with that, but let's, if we take a bit of a parallel to oil and gas in Norway, had we kept all the oil and gas here, we could drive around the car space for free, heat the homes for free, right. but the build-out wouldn't have happened because there would be no one willing to pay for the molecules when they hit that price uh, level, right? So I, th I think there's something around recycling the thinking around it, adding taxation, getting money back to the Norwegian consumers from the molecule or the electrons leaving Norway, rather than pushing the electron into Norway and lowering the price. Because we have now 23 billion NOC set aside for subsidies. I agree the cost will come down for offshore wind, but as costs come down, it's a, it's a balancing act still on the fence of whether without it, that pool of money on the low LCE, which will I think you showed around 50 when Norwegian power prices long term around 35. It's going to be a difficult equation regardless. So how do we take the dialogue and say there were, there's been a huge benefit of exporting to Norway? Yes, prices are higher than they could have been for oil and gas in country if we kept most of it. But there's also a huge benefit by the taxation of the products leaving Norway to more, let's say, valuable economies where they're willing to pay more. I think, so for me, that, that's a really key piece to the puzzle um, that we need to talk more about, that how do we secure that benefit? What? 
Just a quick, uh, there yeah. was uh, two times a big debate in Norway when the oil and gas industry developed first in the early 1970s and then later on, I think it must have been mid 80s, that where should the gas go? And it was an opposition in Norway that, uh, that uh, uh, argued hardly that the gas from the North Norwegian part of the North Sea should only go to Norway. Okay, we ended up not that not being the solution, but that was the debate. And then we would have a plenty of gas and low gas prices in Norway, I can assure you. Uh, and secondly, it was a bit of the same in mid-Norway when gas was discovered there and we ended up with a pipeline into Kjellbergården and some local industry, but it was allowed to be connected to the rest of the system and, and we became part of Europe there. So, but this took a lot of debate before we came to that conclusion. Mm. Good. Tina as well. This all really also, it's happening because the electricity prices are high. When the prices are low, you don't get a lot of these debates. There is a reason there has been basically no debate for the past 20 years in Norwegian pol politics over the fact that we have interconnectors to Europe and that it's a good thing. Nobody really cared about that before mm. now because now it shows the effect, right? So it's, it's the situation happening right now and we have to take it seriously because I think that the time where we are seeing just, just low energy prices that are stable over time is probably a thing of the past. We're going to see, I think, still uh, cheaper prices than in, in Europe, but they're going to be more volatile, and we're going to see like the prices going up, especially during the cold winter months, etc. So it's, it's kind of like a new situation to have to tackle. Uh, when it comes to interconnectors in general, we have earned lots of money on that here in Norway. We have, we have gained enormous value from our position as a high energy country that produces a lot of energy, and this has come consumers to, it's been good for them. I mean, it reduces their, I don't even know what the English word is, netlaya <laughs> has been one of the things. Uh, but nobody really is aware of that, I think. So it's also our job to highlight all the positive effects of, of having that system. And then there's another big debate that is going on right now, and it's part of the whole debate around reaching our climate targets and, and the green shift and everything, but it, it's about nature. It's about the usage of land areas. And I think if you, if you want to conserve more, more of our land and cut down on land usage, it is a good thing to be connected to Europe because that means somebody else is taking the burden of building, for example, new renewable power. And that is being more and more dis difficult to do here in Norway because we feel like we have no more nature to give. I don't know if I agree with that, but, <laughs> but that's also, I think, we need to look for other ways into the debate to highlight what are the pros of actually being connected to our friends and our partners in Europe. And I think that in itself is a good value. It's an important thing. We should be part of that, not sit on the outside and think that we can solve everything on our own. We, we do like to do things on our own, Bård. Yeah, we do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Generally, as a country, we, we, are we, do. We, 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 we are different in every single way. I mean, it, it, there, there are no Norwegians with, with fixed interest rate on their loans. We're, we're just doing things in different ways. I, I started agreeing on these issues with, with uh, Christian back in the early 2010s when I worked for him. I, mean, I would stop doing that uh, yet, but I, I, I have two reflections, and I, I think maybe they, they're a little bit internally contradictory. Uh, n number one uh, has to do with this fact that we have had consistently low energy prices in uh, or low electricity prices in Norway for at least as long as I have lived. Uh, and if we had come in that situation with gas that uh, we were talking about, it would have been bloody difficult to build that pipeline to, to Poland. Uh, it, wh wherever you are when you put, the, uh, put that situation into place, uh, when, you take, uh, when you take that exceptionalism away from people, it's difficult. When you, you have... Uh, you have repression after repression in Iran. The only t uh, time you really got uh, all of the people of Tehran out on the streets was when they cut the, pr the subsidies for petrol. Uh, so so this, this, is, this is an important issue that, that we should be aware of going into this. On the other hand, I think maybe we're, uh, we're overlearning the lessons from the energy crisis. Uh, and I, I, I think that uh, Sero was, was quite on it earlier today. We have sometimes maybe become so scared of how hard the debate was at that point in time. People, uh, people saw, uh, we saw energy poverty in Europe, we, we, uh, we, we saw extreme prices here in Norway, we came in, the state came in with these things. But 
at the end of it, I think that we need to actually stand in debate and say what is right. What is actually what is, uh, what is right is is at the end of the day going to win the day. Uh, and it is so that this, these enormous plans that we have for offshore wind, they don't make a whole lot of sense if, if we don't build that grid. Mm. We, we, can't, we can't build 30 gigawatts of uh, subsidized offshore wind and send all the power to Norway. It ju just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we have to go out there and just tell it like it is. Mm. Uh, I, I was uh, a couple of days ago in this big event, Sefir uh, uh, and a couple of other of these onshore wind people in Norway are building, or they have a project, they're trying to build some onshore wind in the Jövik area. Uh, and uh, there was this uh, debate. And what I saw was that now when local politicians had been given the responsibility, they, they actually have the power, they were taking this very seriously. They were asking, uh, I, I got a couple of hard questions, but the really hard questions com came to the people saying no. Uh, and I think sometimes we, we need to also in this debate when it comes to hybrid cables, when it com comes to the rest of the energy transition, we need to just stand there and say it and say it again and again. This is how we need to do it because uh, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. Are we bold enough, Patrick? I don't think we are. Right, and we, we had a very interesting um, interview with the climate minister for Denmark a couple of months ago. Um, and they were being a bit criticized. Denmark met its climate targets for 2025 uh, late last year. Now, it didn't hurt, right? So nobody really had to suffer. Um, and there was a big, are, are we really there? You, it, it suddenly would just, it just happened out of itself. Yes, they changed the batteries on the calculator, did some tweaking on how you account for the, um, the farming, the farmland CO2 emissions, but still we, we met the climate targets a year ahead. But no one is on the street celebrating it. it people's lives just go on. But the moment we see some adverse effect, people are very, very quickly reactive, right? Uh, and I think it's also our job, both as the industry and policymakers, to shine more light on what is actually happening. Because electrons have never been a, a thing you cared about, right? It, it's just been a product coming out of your power plug, but it, that's no longer the case. And when it can have such a huge downside issue around reputation and uh, what happens when your cost increases, people go to the streets and flock around an internet for us, how do we make that, flip that coin around and say, this is actually what we're doing. We are on track. We are delivering. It's actually not painful for you. It will be beneficial. Hmm. So a lot of expectations <laughs> are put on you politicians uh, moving forward. Um, from the conservatives, from your perspective, what will you do uh, to ensure that we actually can go on this road on the sustainable future in Norway and uh, the future of offshore wind? We want to do a lot and I'm happy to take that position. I'm also happy to stand up and sometimes just say what we need and what is right. Uh, and I, although I agree, I don't agree 100% that we should always say this is to your benefit because some things are just <laughs> not going to be to your benefit. And we have to say that as well <laughs> or else people are going to be really peed off when they uh, realized that this hurt me more than uh, all those fairy tales that you told me about how great this green shift was going to be, because I don't, I don't think that's being fair with people. People have to realize that our electrons have never been worth more than they are now. Without them, we are chanceless at reaching our climate goals. And that has to be like a common understanding if we are to move forward. But on offshore wind policy, uh, make no mistake, we are going to increase the ambitions if we come back to power. We are going to make sure there's predictability in the allocating of both areas, having uh, uh, yearly rounds more, looking more like what we have been doing on oil and gas to get that predictability, the predictability up for the industry. Uh, and to scale up, because that is what we need now. And we will, of course, have probably a more active position on, on working to, to figure out all the difficulties uh, around the grid in the North Sea, because that is not an easy endeavor. It's not like just because we are not right now building a hybrid in Norway, this is something that is just solving itself in Europe. It is a big discussion down there. There is a lot of discussion between the TSOs and et cetera. So, but to be more active on that part, I think I can also promise that, that we will. So we have to move forward and I'll take that position. I'll stand up, I'll say what's right, but you also need to do the same because politicians only do 
they don't only do it, but they tend to like to do what is popular. <laughs> um, so I think let's not take for granted, and this is coming from a good place, and I say this to all people in industry and business that I meet on many different kinds of stages, but don't take for granted that everything is just going to stay the same because you have these two big parties in Norwegian politics that are always going to just stand firm because they also depend on people wanting to vote for them. Um, so the, you can't let them fight the fight on their own. And politicians are not always in the highest regard <laughs> amongst everyone. And we, we, we promise a lot and we want to do a lot, but they need to hear it also from the industry. You need to be more active in the debate. And I know the debate climate today is not a very pleasant place to be. Uh, and it's very black and white, and it's difficult to, to have room for the maybe longer reflections on things and to, to explain all, everything that is complicated, but you have to, you have to join the stage and take part in that discussion because it's also for your own benefit. And like I said earlier, right now offshore wind is popular, but it might all, not always be that. And like the point was made here, it is public money, right? Mm -hmm. At least now in the, in the startup phase. So to keep that both political consensus on it and to the public opinion, being positive, you have to highlight what, what, what is the benefit with this? Why are we doing this? Why is this good for the Norwegian people? How will it come to everyone's good in the future? So join in is my, <laughs> is my join wish. Join in. <laughs> and actually, time flies really, really fast with a good conversation. Thank you all for, for uh, your participation. And now the tables have turned. Now you have the challenge from the politician as well as she has received advice from you. Thank you all for joining today uh, and for being part of this, this great event. I will now give the floor to Anna for some final remarks. Thank you all. Thank you, and uh, I'm fully aware. Oh, there, there, there. Um, there we go. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm fully aware that uh, I'm the only one standing between you and the lunch outside, so <laughs> I'll try to be, be quick. I made a few uh, notes, uh, actually so many that if I take them all, uh, <laughs> there will be no lunch. So uh, starting with the, the ambassador, I think you mentioned that the UK will be spending 50 to 60 billion pounds on a floating offshore wind. That's a lot of money, 700 billion Norwegian kroners. That should help getting the costs <laughs> down and the technology going. Uh, I uh, noted from Luis the, the grid of the future and uh, how difficult it is, how important it is that we move together. Authorities, NGOs, everyone, we have to work together to, to, to get this moving. I uh, noted from uh, Yaran uh, that the energy uh, consumption will actually go down, it will peak and then go down. That was a little surprising for me, I wasn't aware, but uh, that's because of the efficiency of the electrifications and uh, the more effective um, energy. And also that uh, renewables will push out the fossil fuels. Um, and that's the way to, to do it rather than trying to, to s stop the fossil first and then having no alternative. Sigrun was um, talking about the targets we have can be met. It's not a problem. Technology is there and the funding should be there. It's not that costly compared to other things we have been doing in this country. So, uh, so I think that's a fair challenge. So why can't we make it happen? I think, uh, and then Andreas uh, mentioned the, the new technologies within aviation and uh, the starting with the small aircrafts and the drones. And this will come. It's not that many years till it happens. And it's um, definitely an industry that will see a lot of revolutionary uh, technologies coming up. And the energy efficiency also, you mentioned it on electricity and, and hydrogen. So, um, and then, see if I can interpret my own writing here. Uh, Patrick was um, mentioning the, the low prices that Norway has and will continue to have in the next 10 years. So we will be lower than uh, Germany, UK and other countries. And that is also a challenge because um, at the same time we have enormous potential for, for offshore wind, probably one of the biggest uh, wind potentials in Europe. But um, the wind is strong, fine, but the conditions are difficult. So it needs to be integrated. We need to find other ways of utilizing the, the green electrons. And um, Christian was uh, mentioning also that the floating costs will come down. So we should not look at today's prices. We have to look forward. We have to um, 
look ahead and make the strategic decisions now for the future. And the cost will definitely come down and with new technologies. I think Board also mentioned that uh, maybe one day floating will be cheaper than bottom fixed because of new technological breakthroughs. Uh, it was also mentioned that hybrids is very important. Uh, it's a key to success for the future. We have to have hybrid solutions. And um, Board also mentioned innovation has, is the key here. And you know, mentioned the technical uh, transition, not only an energy transition, but we need a technical transition as well. And I think the final words from, from Tina is great. We have to work together, we have to stay in this together and inform um, and be, be honest and open about what are the benefits and what are the downsides. There will be some disadvantages as well and we should be open about that. So with that, I thank you all for coming, thank the panelists and thank uh, the embassy for, for hosting uh, this at this wonderful residence. And uh, hope to see you again next year. And with that, please have some lunch. <laughs>